Welcome back, everybody, to Cardiff, and welcome to the climax of the Quad Nations 2024. It's wheelchair rugby, and we're here at the Sport Wales National Centre. It's the medal matches. I'm with gold medalist from the Tokyo Paralympics with Team GB, Jim Roberts. And we're going to see your GB in action for the bronze against France. Yeah, not the not the medal game that they were hoping for, but hopefully we'll see GB really strong today and uh, and getting that gold that bronze medal. I mean, yeah, not the medal match that they wanted to be in up against a real stiff USA side. But prior to that, no defeats. So, do you feel that maybe they put in an underwhelming performance against USA or? They were, they were bested by USA. Where do you think their heads are coming into this French fixture? They, they were coming in really strong to the before this morning's game against USA. USA were really strong, but there were some uncharacteristic errors from GB that they'll, they'll be looking to rectify in this game. OK, what about France? You were in the stands for that one, so you could put your feet up. You could really soak up what was a really entertaining matchup against Japan and one that, similar to GB, they came out swinging in the fourth quarter and almost mounted an incredible comeback. There's some really well-matched teams here, and I think the Japan-France game really showcased that. What's going to be tough for France is, obviously, they've gone back-to-back -back now, and we'll have to try and rectify that. Well, lights have gone off. The, light, the lights have gone off. That must mean that the pyrotechnics are coming out, and it's going to be game time. So should we have a look at the teams, and let's pick out some of the key individuals here and let's just look at GB look all the talk was of um, was of uh, Robinson before the first match but really it was Aaron Phipps who stole the show in that fourth quarter yeah it'll be interesting to see if Aaron gets some court time in this game he really dominated that last fourth quarter performance so so be, I'll be keen to see that he gets some court time in this game coming so here they are, that's the GB squad and the mix-up of Aaron Phipps and also someone who caught the eye was, was David Ross as well as a relative newcomer to the GB setup. Yeah, really new, really, well, yeah, like you said, newcomer to the GB elite team, um, but he was consistent, got a couple turnovers, so exciting to see where his future lies in the sport. Right, let's talk about France. European champions, these two met each other in that final in 2024 and... Well, the big name is Jonathan Evener. That's where all the noise is, but there's a lot of other threats in there, looking at Sebastian Verdun, Cedric Nanka, and, uh, you know, who, who would you pick out amongst those? Yeah, you've mentioned all the big players for them. Cedric Nanka is one of the best defensive players in the world. He was really making it hard work for Daisuke at the end of that, that Japanese-France game, so keep an eye out for him. But like you mentioned, Jonathan Evener will be pushing his absolute wheels off and he will be France's star player. He will be France's star player and there's a little bit more atmosphere being injected into the arena for the medal occasions. The lights have been dimmed, the players are off the court and the music's that, that little bit more dramatic in here as well now, Jim. And look, this isn't the absolute biggest prize in the game, but it's a significant stepping stone en route to the Paralympics in Paris. How does the mentality differ when you come into a medal match? It, it shouldn't differ at all. The, the guys know it's not the game they wanted to play, but they've had to regroup and pick themselves up really quite quickly for what is essentially a really fast turnaround and, and get themselves mentally and physically ready to, to perform for a, a bronze medal. Fast turnaround, fast turnaround for GB, a rapid turnaround for France. They only came off the court about an hour or so ago. So what's the toll that takes physically? Oh, it's huge. They, they, they've put in a massive effort against Japan and, and, and they'll be feeling the, the, the effects of that physically and mentally. So, so to see how they bounce back and, and see what energy they come out with here will be really, really interesting for me especially. Well, here we are, the light show and the pyrotechnics. And isn't it fitting that a pyrotechnic player who brings all the fireworks, even at, is followed rather swiftly by the wrecking ball. Cedric Nanka, there wearing number four, Adrian Chalma. Is Mathieu Thierrier. The hits just keep on coming with Brice Morel. All these French individuals are not just fighting for a medal here, but they're fighting.
for their standing in this French side for a home Paralympics. I mean, what an, in, what an incredible moment for them. I know that you were in the stands at 2012 in London. That's a, you know that's how kind of you were inspired into it. Was yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I was inspired by the crowd, the occasion, what home games we put on in 2012, and the French players will be absolutely. They'll be wanting to stake their name on a claim and being on that ticket for the French team and the home Paralympics. It's going to be huge. Well, here you go. The volume rises that little bit more for GB, led out by Gavin Walker, the captain, Jonathan Coggan, one of the Tokyo gold medalists, Stu Robinson, Jack Smith. David Ross, who had that really positive impact in the final stanza of that disappointing semi-final loss. Well, another one of the newcomers, relatively Kieran Flynn out in 11, and there you have him, the whiz kid, Aaron Phipps, wearing 13. He brought huge energy, really sort of turned the tide in the latter stages of that semi-final against the USA. I wonder how much we'll get to see of him as the teams line up and they prepare for the anthems. that the national anthem will mean an awful lot having been awarded a medal to it but there is nothing quite like a rendition of La Marseillaise and the French fans are out in force as well as vibrant as those in the Union Jacks in the stands and the French in white readying themselves for a bronze medal contest against GB who are beginning to go through their final manoeuvres and ready themselves to hopefully end with a bit of metal, metal at the ends of this three days competition. Should be a really exciting game. Now, France are double European champions at the moment. They're back to back. GB will definitely be looking to get a bit of revenge ready for a, what will be a home Paralympic Games. Well, there they are. And there are GB laser focused. Where do you think where do you think the game is won and lost between these two stylistically? You've got to be able to stop Jonathan Hivene. When he gets moving, he's so fluid with his pushing, he just looks looks effortless on the court. If you can really disrupt his game, you'll you'll go a long way to disrupting the way that France play. And then if you're looking at it from a from a French perspective with GB. Well, they're they're gonna be looking to target Stuart Robinson, making making the rest of GB players do it, do a little bit more work with the ball than perhaps Stuart would like. Um, but he, he's going to be 
absolutely pivotal in, in how GB play today. The gold medal match to come after this one, Japan and USA in the big one. But for now, our focus on this bronze medal. Here at the Sport Wales National Centre, it's been a great venue to host really some of the very, very best players in the world when it comes to wheelchair rugby. All four of these nations are going to be vying for medals come Paris in the summer. So we see uh, France with a very high-low lineup. So they've got two extremely high-point players and two low-point players where GB have gone for a more balanced lineup, probably looking to pass the ball a little bit more than France will. France win the first possession. And off goes that man, Ivan Up, who was really bristling in the latter stages against Japan, but it was a bit of a case of too little, too late. And just talking about those strategies, that's uh, a reference to the classification of the players based on their functionality, that the higher the score, the more able and more functional the athlete and you can only have a certain number of points on the court at any one stage that number is eight so the strategy you're talking about the high low with even who's about to score here a high category player two high category players and two lower category players yeah so so france are running um a, a two 3.0 players a 1.5 player and a 0.5 player whereas gb have gone for one 3.5 player two 2.0 players and one 0 0.5 player so you're just seeing a couple different versions of, of adding up to eight points. And that puts a lot of pressure on the high classification players as, as everybody is all locked up here at the moment. And the timeout is forced to be called. Yeah, really good defensive set there from, from France. Cedric Nankin had GB's inbounder trapped on the baseline. Stuart and Johnny were trapped on the halfway line and ju there was just no option to pass to Gavin. So, so a good use of the time out there that didn't really have an option and, and would not want to be giving away turnovers this early in the game. Well, interestingly, timeouts became a bit of a feature of France's semi-final because they used all of their timeouts in the first half. So they didn't have any to use for, for the rest of the match, which put them under a bit of pressure. Yeah, and, and that's what you find. I, I always refer to them as get out of jail free cards. Uh, and, and France is one of those teams that if they've got them, they'll use them when they need to, but then seem to be one of these teams that are just always there scoring tries. Always there scoring tries. And it's 2-1, uh, well, sorry, two apiece, I beg your pardon, as, as France come with the inbound. A lot of bodies down there. Yeah, illegal use of hands called though for uh, for Stuart Robinson. He got his, he got caught there reaching for the ball on Sebastian Verda. So Stu Robinson out of the game for the next 60 seconds or until France next score. So three v four. So I'll, I'll be looking for for France to set up a defensive set. Obviously they've got the power play at the moment on this offensive set with um with Stuart in the bin. They'll then look to uh, to set up their next defensive set to try and make the most of this opportunity. Well, Verdun initially has the ball, then it's into Ivanat, and he bides his time, and the rest of the French players converge upon that penalty box. Yeah. So GB have now been forced for Stewart to call inbound. That it's not a a strategy that they particularly like to employ in a game. Well, we saw it work to great success against Japan when EK got put as the inbound and a similar result has occurred. A turnover here for France, so it's tried and tested tactic. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what France would have been looking for. Forced an inexperienced inbounder to inbound and they managed to result in a turnover. Even at looking to capitalise and take the first break of the game, which he does in pretty emphatic fashion, whizzing 
through the GB ranks and again, very, very tight defensively from France. But Shu Robinson does retrieve it on this side. There's no one at home at the back. So Kieran Flynn will coast across. I just want to highlight some really clever play there from Kieran Flynn. He knew that the, the French number three was looking to pick him up on the line. So he directed Jonathan Coggan just to make sure that that couldn't happen. And it allowed him to be that outlet later on in the play. Even that. Linking up with his high point buddy, Sebastian Verda, who gets met by two GB chairs. Even now, spinning on his wheels, but getting himself into a spin, and France. Not a typical one you see from France, a really key turnover there for GB. Really good press, forced France more than 12 seconds. They couldn't break the half in 12 seconds um, and resulting in a GB turnover. Not often you see that. Not at this level, no. Um, when when teams that players are starting out, it's, it's one of the more obvious ones, but, but at this level, it's, it's one of those that you very, very rarely see. So Shu Robinson, we saw GB when they were warming up, practicing a lot of these key strike plays. Uh, more often than not, it was Robinson the battering ram. But there's a little bit of guile there as he slips down the wing. Just the smallest of gaps left on the left edge of the key. And here comes Verda. Verda, all power and strength in the upper body, but he's met his match in Aaron Phipps, who's a terrier. Verda does really well to retrieve it, almost loses it as he dribbles free of Phipps. And well, Phipps winces knowing how close he was there. Really, really good defensive set there from Aaron. He worked incredibly hard to get back to Sebastian. Phipps and Robinson. Robinson on his own, colliding with the chair of Le Guin. And he links up with Phipps and these two are working in unison rather nicely, aren't they? And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing very similar tactics from both teams. Both teams employing a high-low lineup. So we've just got a break in play for, you know, what feels like the customary changing of a Robinson wheel. Yeah. Defensive players definitely target him, try and slow him down. If they can get a puncher, they'll they'll try that as well. I wouldn't like to be Stu Robinson's mechanic. It's a busy day out there on the court. All I, times. I wouldn't like to be his wallet, having to pay for all those new tubes. <laughs> well, here goes Eva. Eva uh, just soaks up the hits and almost lets some of the big hitters fly by. And again. He's all locked up, finds an avenue to Verdan, who almost gets trapped, and then Phipps is maybe a little bit loose with that limb. Yeah, I mean, really good defensive set. They had uh, Jonathan Hivene very close to the halfway line, almost an over and back, but yeah, like you mentioned, a little bit perhaps clumsy from Aaron with the reach in there, not, not as clinical as he would have liked to be. Bit of a change in the French line. Some new personnel enter the field of play. Matthew Tillier wearing seven and Adrien Chalma wearing four. Once everybody's happy with the scores locked at five all and less than five minutes remaining of the opening quarter. Even that. <laughs> just Fanc fancies a tussle. <laughs> just bull bullying Jack there around the court. Not not entirely sure what Jack's done to him, but <laughs> not sure there was uh, any need for that. What's it? Is it? Is there much? Is there much chat? Is there much sort of um, sort of verbal jousting out there on the, the court as there, well? There are definitely. Ooh. So just, just to pick up on what's happened there, so Aaron's been called for travelling the line as he's inbounded the ball. 
So where you inbound the ball, you must come on, on the court at that point. What the referees said is that Aaron's come on at not where he threw the ball in from. But to go back to your earlier question, yeah, there's there's a couple players in on the world stage that, that like to think they can get a little bit of an advantage by giving you a little bit of chat during the game. They're often the ones that go quietest when uh, th their team's not doing well. <laughs> well, Aaron Phipps does his talking with his wheels. Clatters into Ivanar, who goes around the edge and cops a late hit as well. That spins oh. Ivanar, and there could be trouble here for Phipps. This could be a flagrant foul. They've given the penalty goal, but Aaron, yeah, Aaron's going to the bin. So this is huge for France. Aaron will now have to sit off for a further two minutes or until France score two more goals, or two more tries, sorry. So a flagrant foul sees Phipps and GB punished for two minutes or two scores. And just to, just talk through why that is different to some of the meteor legal collisions that we've been seeing out so, there. So what we've seen there was a couple of things. So Aaron hits um, Jonathan Hivenet behind the axle, and that in itself is a foul play. Um, it means that you don't have full control of your chair when you're getting hit behind the, the centre of gravity. What made that instance more dangerous is the fact that it's happened on the goal line, on the try line, and so that there's an added risk factor, um, and and that's what we've seen. It, they, you get harsher punishment for for that 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 situation. Is that a rush of blood to the head from Aaron Phipps, or is that just a, a slight timing issue? I, I see that as a timing issue. Um, probably should have pulled out of it, but. The margins at this level are that tight. He was half a second earlier and he'd, he'd have hit Jonathan Hivenet into the cone and it would have been a turnover for GB. So, so you really are looking at these ultra-fine margins and, and unfortunately for Aaron, he's come off on the, on the worst side of that one. And for teams that are this closely matched, that could be quite an instrumental point in this game. Another wheel bites the dust here at the Sport Wales National Centre. Aaron Phipps continues to watch on from afar. And oh, Paul Shaw is in conversation with one of our referees. We've got Elvira Zielska and Evelina Kaminska out there on duty for this one. I and couldn't tell you which one's which, I'll be honest. Well, well, Paul Short has got a lot to say to whoever it may be. Yeah, pro probably just questioning the decision, as, as a coach should, just making sure that if there's any chance he can get Aaron back on the court any earlier, then, then yeah, that's what they'll be looking for. A decisions habitually overturned in wheelchair rugby? I mean, very, do those, very do those rarely. those protestations ever? I've, I've seen it very rarely. Good take from Jack Smith, but he's lost possession there. Into the arms of Ivanat. He's very, very vocal out there. Yeah. So, so with um, France have got a power play at the moment, with Aaron being in the bin, they're really trying to work hard on defence, make sure that the GB don't have any options. Jamie Stead has Verdat. Right in his view, so Stead goes long. But possession goes to France. So this is this has been a, a basically a three goal swing for France. Huge moment in the match. Flagrant fouls, something of a rarity in the uh, wheelchair rugby game. They do happen, um, Tokyo, 2020, uh, I had two flagrant fouls against me. One um, was in the Canadian Canadian game, um, one with uh, against Japan, and, and both of those were fairly instrumental yeah. in us and us getting to where we we en eventually ended up. Timmy Stead delays the ball. 
He's trapped by Shalma. And the call for a timeout is forced. Yeah. It's what France have done there really as well, is, is they knew Aaron was stuck in the penalty bin. They trapped him coming on from the penalty bin and were ready for when he made his inbound. So they actually trapped him on the inbound line as well. It just made that offense really, really difficult for, for GB. And so France actually showing some real technical nice, nice at this game. Well, they've really sought to capitalize as much as possible on that flagrant foul, haven't they? They have, um, and, and it showed the score line, four goals up um, already in the first quarter is, is a good position to be in. But also forcing GB to use one of those get out of jail free cards. And a long, long last, the pressure valve is released and the captain cruises across. There's a lot to do here for GB, who remember in their semi-final against the USA, fell behind early in the first quarter and were never fully capable of recovering. G. Robinson, long to his captain. Yeah. And, that, and that's what we've seen in, in this game is obviously GB have made a bit of a tactical change. They've brought their balance line back on again, slowed the offence down, but it allows them more passing options, so it makes it a lot harder for France to defend, but perhaps doesn't give them quite as many defensive options as having Aaron on the court. Wow. I've got great admiration for the footwork of our referee out there who skipped past the flying Frenchman, even up. He's unable to skip past the challenges. Coggins after him and Robinson's coming round, but even as too fast. Yeah, I think uh, Stuart bailed out of that one for the worried about what he might do. Similar, similar situation to Aaron was in a couple of minutes ago. Big boom in the middle of the court and an easy ride for Robinson all the way to the try line. France breaking. Verdun is being hassled by Kieran Flint. He now blasts into Coggan as even our looks for an opening. Oh, stolen by Robinson, who's first to the bounce. It pings off the oh. Frenchman's chair. Not sure I agree with that call. I think. Uh, Stewart was really smart there. What he did was he actually pushed the ball back into uh, Jonathan Ivanay's chair. So technically, I thought that ball came off a French play. It should really be GB ball, but perhaps the referee didn't quite see it as clear as I did. I saw it the same as you there, but we had some very, very good seats here right in line from our commentary position. And we just want to emphasize that it is an extremely difficult game to referee and these 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 referees are doing an absolutely phenomenal job. There is so much going on, isn't there, in the yeah. game of wheelchair rugby. Like some, some of the calls are so marginal and they're, they're absolutely instinctive as well and they're immediate. They really are. The, the, the referees have to be watching out for so much. There's, there's 10 seconds, no dribble. You've got to pass or bounce every 10 seconds. There's 12 second counts. So the referees are making all of these counts in their head as well as trying to look out for any potential fouls or any any law breaks that, that might be occurring as well. Well, if you think about how much is going on in wheelchair rugby compared to football and rugby who use TMO and VAR to agonise over decisions, it almost makes a mockery of it, really, because it's so much busier out here on court at various moments, you'd argue. It really is. There's, a, like, there, there's so much going on, and that's why there are two referees, but... You could almost make the argument that you need need three or four at some, some stages of the game. Well, GB need three or four tries to get back on terms with France here. Trailing 9.13, clock is past 30 seconds. Kieran Flynn arrives to take the pass from Robinson. So... France have really stepped up their defensive pressure. You could just see how much hassle that Stu was, was able to sort of 
well, negate in, in that instance, but when you've got that much function on you, trying to get the ball, it does make you feel like you're under a lot of pressure. Uh, even at has nowhere to go. He is sworn. And is there a last gasp chance for GB? No, there isn't as they run out of time. But they end the quarter trailing 13 points to 10. The French, the far happier, including Cedric Nankin. Yeah, so there's actually some real positives that GB can take away from the end of that quarter. They, they ended up scoring the last goal of the quarter and they will have the arrow coming out of the the quarter so it could be a two goal swing for them so where the score is now 13 10 it could very well be 13 11 and, and it becomes a lot tighter game interesting as well there the the french team holding out uh instruction cards that card there at the end down here last what are they saying La last play last try last, last try. try so there are around 20 seconds left on the on the game clock for france to score um, which is plenty of time in wheelchair rugby. They, they, France will definitely be disappointed they didn't get last goal, but, but also GB will be really happy that they managed to put on a really solid defence and, and kept France from scoring. What's, uh, what was the process for you, for GB, in terms of receiving messaging from the sidelines? Um, so obviously you want to try and make sure that you know what the clock's doing yourself. There's not always that them you can hear what's going on on the bench while while they are shouting their absolute heart outs. Sometimes the crowd is just that loud that you can't hear it. So, so first and foremost, the responsibility is on the players on court. But, but at the same time, you want to be always glancing at the bench, making sure that you're picking up any messages that they might be trying to get onto you. The holding up of placards is that, is that a reasonably rare technique? No, we've we've seen it a little bit. We've seen um, colours being used. Uh, one of our old coaches used to keep. Um, tape on his knee to show us how many timeouts we had left uh thing just <laughs> just just little things like that to make just to help you guys on court a little bit obviously they can't be on the court with you but anything that they can do just just to make it that little bit easier tape on the knee yeah now that is that is a novel one yeah so start off the game with four pieces of tape on 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 his knee um and as 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 you burn through your timeouts the less and less pieces of tape as it stands most of the timeouts intact here GB with three France with four but the main tally that everyone's focused on is the scoreboard it's France the European champions the back-to-back -back European champions who are showing that they're currently still the top dogs in Europe after one quarter's play 13-10 and as Jim said GB crucially scoring the last try and also with the possession to start the second quarter. Yeah, this is this well, fingers crossed, touch wood that GB managed to get this converted because it'll set them up really well for the second quarter and hopefully they can they can start clawing back that deficit that they're in. We've seen a little bit of a lineup change from France as well. They've taken off Sebastian Verdun, who was, I must say, was playing exceptionally well this tournament. Sue Robinson takes the uh, the back door on that occasion and the deficit is two. France looking to strike on the counter. They are repelled. Brees Morel might just have been dispossessed. Stu Robinson's all over him and he shovels it to even at in a hurry in a bid to get himself out of bother. 11 seconds on the shot clock. Even at looking for an avenue to the try line spots just the smallest bit of space and it's enough to squeeze through and that's what GB are really looking to do now now France have made that lineup change 
wouldn't typically see this as France's strongest line, so GB will really be looking to sort of try and get some turnovers here. There you go, there's another dent in the Robinson wallet on yeah. the, on the, uh, the tyre tubes. Yeah, so what, what we're seeing here is usually the, the tyres will puncture. Um, you get a direct hit on the tyre. Uh, we're running these tubes at around 120 to 150 psi. So, so when you do catch them just right, they tend to go bang in a hurry. The poor, the poor mechanics on the GB side of things are working overtime on the pumps. Yeah, and and, and we're you they they're used to it. You get some. Uh, and it's usually the lower the level of rugby, the more punctures that you'll get. Um, we don't generally see that many at international, but. Unfortunately for Stuart, we've seen a couple today. Well, it's working out well for the uh, for the gun show of the mechanics who were uh, who were working hard on the pump. Yeah, Tom's getting a workout in for sure. Fourteen twelve. Two and a bit minutes played of this second quarter. One and a bit, I beg your pardon. Oh, there was a sticky ball that came in there, looking to dislodge it from Ivana, but he's so determined. So, referee's calling contact before the whistle. I think that's France's second warning, which means they'll now be down a player, giving GB a, a bit of a power play on the next offensive set. And contact bef before the whistle. Yeah, so in between um, scores. So we'll see here, Kieran will score. Um, before the ball's inbounded, that is between the whistles. So contact before the whistle. Um, and generally, there shouldn't be any chair to chair or aggressive over contact. A lot of players will do it to try and get a defensive advantage. But, but here we've seen the referee call it and, uh, and actually send a player to the bin. We'll get an opportunity just to see the jockeying and jousting and as he said no premature contact even at gets the left and right pumping so distinctive this sprinting style that he has it is a really unique pushing style not many people in the world uh, push the same way Jonathan is and and it's really elusive you're not sure which way it's gonna go is it right or is it left Oh, absolutely huge defensive play there from Jonathan Coggan. What he did was manage to back up on um, on the French number 44 and it stopped him going across the goal line. Basically what the call is, is in and out. He got one wheel over, but because he didn't get two wheels over, then it resulted in a turnover to GB, which they've now just capitalized on. Well, that's the turnover they needed. That's for sure. One more for parity. Oh, it's another turnover from Stu Robinson, but all oh, the ball will and the paint will beat him, and we almost lose one of our referees into the French bench as well. She manages to regain her balance. Yeah, great little reach there from Stuart. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to track down the loose ball. We're seeing another lineup change here for France, and uncharacteristically, they're taking off Jonathan Hivenet. GB will definitely be looking to try and capitalise. Any time that he's off the court, they really want to be trying to get some turnovers. So instrumental for the French, even at... We did see him spend some time off against Japan, but it occurred very a lot later in the contest. Defensively, France are looking pretty strong here. Of course, Stu Robinson goes the long way around, finds a ball inside, and look at that D from Cedric Nanka. Still. GB unable to finish the opportunity, but eventually the resolve. And what, and what Cedric Nanku did so well there. So technically, the, I'd call that um, a, a foul because he hit 
uh, Kieran behind the axle, but because he was able to push so much weight through the, the hit, he was able to keep Kieran down on the ground and actually, um, of course, real defensive pressure there. He then shows us a bit of glitz as he flips one over the top behind his back and the ball bounces loose and that is a big moment for GB. And then, I don't know if you noticed it there, but Sebastian Verdam was trying to call a timeout. What you're not allowed to do is once the ball has been thrown, you can't call a timeout whilst it's in the air. And he was, he was protesting to the referee that he called it before that. Well, the French have retreated. Yeah, so I think they've taken a bench timeout at the moment just to just to settle themselves. There's been a couple turnovers now that have gone gone GB's way. We're we're all square. We're 15 apiece. France will want to just bring their guys in, calm them down reset the roles and, and hopefully come out again uh, as they have been really strong this, this first half. It's a good contest and one that GB had battled to get back into having trailed off to the opening quarter. And that was an instance that France could have used a timeout. They were, they were struggling to get out within 12 seconds and they forced something they didn't need to. They could have burnt one of their timeouts, get out of jail free card and um, and gone again from there, but that's perhaps a little bit of inexperience in the lineup that's on currently. And you know, is it, who who is charged with being able to call a timeout within the team? Anyone, anyone that's on the court at that time. But but strategically for you as a team, like did, did you have a rule when you were playing that there were? only certain decision makers who had the power to call that timeout because you'll, it's a big responsibility if you get it you'll wrong. You'll definitely have your on-court captains which will pro, pro, well, mainly be the, um, the, the high point players, the ones that are dealing with the ball most. So, But typically it's whoever's holding the ball has the right first and foremost to call a timeout. But up, straightens up. Gets across the line for France. 16 all. Robinson linking up with his captain who manages to manipulate his body to take it well high on the chest and feeds it back to Robinson who retakes the lead for GB. Jarlan dribbles the ball ahead and goodness me that is a lot of blue jersey surrounding one Frenchman. Really good call there from the French player. He knew he was completely surrounded by blue shirts and, and had to call the timeout. So eventually a timeout does get called. Comes from Jordan Ducré. That's the dexterous take from Gavin Walker before feeding back to Robinson. And from the ensuing inbound, France had themselves surrounded. Ducre called the timeout. And just at the moment, feeling a bit of a momentum swing back to GB, aren't you? Yeah, I, I think the lineup changes that France have made perhaps haven't gone completely in their favour, and, and GB have really capitalised on those. This, this balance line that we're seeing GB are really sort of stepping up. Verdam manages to wriggle free and he continues to use that upper body power to drive his way to the line. Jonathan Coggan finds Stu Robinson. He flips the ball out the back of the hand and well, it's read fabulously by Gavin Walker. Yeah, I think, I think Gavin was sweating chasing that one down. It was perhaps Dad hadn't quite realised what run Sebastian Verdun was going was gonna to challenge. It's 
Cedric Nakar. Completely unattended. And he now jostles with Kieran Flynn. Cedric Nanka has got a grin from ear to ear as he's jostling there. He uh, seems like a lively, playful character, despite the sometimes brutality of his defence. And brutality of defence, it, it absolutely is. He, is. he is a phenomenal defensive player. Unbelievably strong and, and, the, and the mass of the man. He, he really, when he gets a pick on you, it, it is, it's like sticky, sticky glue. You, you really struggle. He makes you work for every inch you have to work around him. I'd purposely do three extra pushes just to make sure he didn't touch my chair. <laughs> Drew Robinson comes firing in to his opposite Frenchman, and it's really smart work. GB and France matching one another point for point at the moment. In this second quarter, two minutes and three seconds remaining. And as we've mentioned all the way through this tournament, this is the time when teams start to look to manage that clock. Walker feeding Kieran Flynn. Yeah, you see Kieran just taking a few extra little seconds there, make sure he gets the clock exactly where he wants it. France are gonna have to go over the top, Verdan almost gets dispossessed and oh that's a beautiful transfer to Verdan, he worked really hard to get round the corner. Thirty seconds on the clock. Twenty all. To Robinson up against Verdan. This is a a good matchup. Oh wow! Great awareness. Him yeah. and Walker are working really nicely so, together. So what you saw there was perfect example of a pick and roll. So you're sort of isolating battles, leaving your leaving the defensive line in a bit of a dog leg. Something you see a lot of in uh, NBA basketball. When you're playing, did you seek a lot of tactical inspiration from other court sports? Yeah, so basketball is is a huge sort of um, where a lot of the tactics come from, especially movement around the court, wheelchair basketball, ice hockey in terms of the blocking and things like that. So, so yeah, you're always trying to take inspiration um, where you can and, and trying to get an edge, edge up on the competition. Third out. we go pressure was building for a it moment really for GB. was so Cedric had been in the key close to 10 seconds but in the end it was GB that had four in the key that, that caused the penalty goal penalty try sorry Shoe Robinson he found the going tough early this morning against the USA is Found his groove here against France. Circles back, invites a bit of Bosch, and then links up with Walker. This all about the clock management as we tick towards 15 seconds remaining. Yeah, and perhaps for the uninitiated in the sport, you're wondering why they just didn't take that early, early try. But um, but yeah, what you're seeing is uh, exactly that clock management. And France now man in the bin. So it should give uh, GB the power play to score. 12.9 12 seconds left on the game clock. Perfect outcome there, really, as far as GB were concerned. Into the hands of Robinson. Oh, Matadors. Naka past his chair. Well, I think GB would have liked to take a couple more seconds off that clock than, uh, than five. Five seconds left. I've seen, I've seen France score with a, with a lower number than that. Wow, they nearly pulled out the miracle pass in the last gasp against Japan. But on this occasion, they're unable to make those extra seconds count. 
And it's big slaps on the back all round for the GB boys. They've been out there and they've overturned the first quarter deficit. And they head into the half-time, leading France 22 points to 21. Yeah, GB have got to be absolutely ecstatic with that quarter. Real turnaround from the from the first one. Um, overcoming that flagrant foul, going into the half with a with a one try lead is is enormous for GB. Well, plenty of moments to enjoy in this contest, and namely in that second quarter from GB. Stu Robinson has seemed to be really, really focused, particularly in that second quarter. Yeah, you didn't see any mistakes from uh, from GB in that second quarter, and that was really encouraging to see. So so in the semi-final earlier against USA's, we saw some uncharacteristic uh, mistakes, but, but it looks like they've really sharpened up. France have dug in and they've really fought hard to maintain pace with GB who are beginning to look increasingly confident out there. Yeah, and we've got, we've got to emphasise as well that um, this is a, a build-up tournament to the Paralympic Games in Paris later this summer. All the teams will be uh, really trying to sharpen their, the, the edge of their, uh, their attack and defence. Well, half time here. GB leading France 22 points to 21. Second half and a key second half that will deliver one of these nations a bronze medal in coming very shortly.
Here we go. We're in Cardiff at the Wheelchair Rugby Quad Nations 2024. It has been three fabulous days of competition with four of undeniably the best nations in the world on show here. USA and Japan are going to show down for the gold medal match in a moment. But right here, you can see the passions are running high for GB and France, who are separated by one point in their quest to come away with the bronze medal from this competition. It's been a fascinating match so far. France came out at real ascendancy in the first quarter. GB managed to claw it back in the second, so all I can say is game on from here on in. Game on indeed, and some interesting tactical calls from France there as well. Midway through the second quarter, the removal of Jonathan Ivanar to mix up the line that they were offering, and well, the proof is in the scoreboard. It didn't really work out for the French. No, it didn't, but they, they've really got to manage uh, the player load. Obviously, France have gone back-to-back -back games, um, and Jonathan's had an extremely big player load. He does a lot of work for the French team, so, so resting him might have been a real tactical genius move. And also, you know, eyes on later on in the year as well. You, you've got to have a plan B and a plan C for, you know, God forbid, you know, a player gets injured or, you know, or plan A isn't working. You need to have that variety to offer in games against different opposition. You really do. You've got to blood in these players. You've got to know that they can perform on the highest level. And, and without doubt, that's what this is. This is the highest level. Undeniably the highest level. And that's a nice little bit of ticker tacker wheelchair rugby right there to unlock the GB defence after mere seconds in this second half. The introduction of Riyad Salem. One of the elder statesmen in wheelchair rugby. He's been about around for a number of years now and is, is a phenomenal player, but perhaps coming to the twilight of his career, but still offers France something pretty magical when he's on form. Well, the the carrot of a home Paralympic Games might just do that in terms of career extension, and it slips from his grasp. Yeah, a little, little bit of uh, arguments there between the French team. Uh, big turnover for GB, especially this early in the third quarter. An inquisition at the back for the French. Great opportunity for Stu Robinson and co. With Aaron Phipps and all of his explosivity onto the corner as well. He bombards into the French line and Robinson skirts around the edges. Salem looking to make amends but meeting Phipps and timeout called by Ivana with the clock against them. Yeah, big, big first couple of, well, first minute for GB in this in this third quarter. Timeout and a turnover. Timeout called there by even now because they weren't looking like they were going to get across the halfway within 12 seconds. And a chance to reset as well. of bumping and shunting in there as Salem is harried, finds a great ball to Ivanar who sort of wriggles his way in that style to the line. Have you, ever, have, you ever tried, have you ever tried that technique? Uh, once or twice, didn't really work for me. I was more um, more of a symmetrical pusher, I think, than, uh, than what he, he does. Back on court and linking up nicely with Robinson. It was it was Phipps's flagrant foul in the opening quarter that sort of flipped the balance of power, as well as Jonathan even as chair. Yeah. But so we've got. Um, I'm really excited to see how this line does for GB. We've got a lot of pace, a lot of power, and I'm hoping that Stu and Aaron can can pull some magic out. Would you see this, uh, would this be your starting line for GB come 
Paris in a big uh, match, or is it dependent on the opposition? I'm not involved enough in the in the team to, to know what's really performing well, but but in terms of an onlooker in, it's it's so exciting when you've got this much power uh, on the court. Off he goes, and he won't be caught. No. 26 plays 24. Yeah, Aaron Phipps, probably the fastest man in, in wheelchair rugby and, and has been for a number of years. Our biggest uh, challenge for Tokyo was trying to get him to stop. <laughs> I'd say, say he and collectively, you, you got the recipe rather right out there. Didn't turn out too badly. France looking to rebuild. Adrian Chalma. Salem. Coggan making life difficult for him in a real nuisance. And he fights to get across the halfway just in the nick of time. Then Phipps arrives on the scene. He's all arms and energy. Even up, almost gets his pocket picked. Coggan's there. Then Phipps, really watchful, defence is set, even up, looking to pirouette his way towards the line, and that's a great ball. There's some real good defensive energy coming from uh, GB at the moment, and it's putting France under all sorts of pressure. You never want to be passing to your low point players, but in that instance, France had to, and, and luckily it paid off for them. The France, has, France has scored there, but just in terms of the emotional and physical exhaustion that that puts on France, will that act as a build-up if, if GB are able to maintain that sort of level? It really does. In your psyche, when you're struggling to score, you're worrying about that and perhaps not focusing on, on defence as hard as you should. And then it almost compounds on itself, play after play. It's harder and harder for you to score and then you, then you worry less about defending. So, um, yeah, it'll definitely be playing in the back of their minds. Obviously, these players are experienced enough to not let it affect them too much. But, but yeah, it would all, always worry me. Jack Smith. Inbounds to Robinson. Coggan and Smith working hard in their own half of the court. And it is... Free ride, as far as Robinson's concerned. Yeah, coast to coast. Even uh, manages to break free. Salem goes long, and Salem scores. So what you saw there was Jonathan really being patient, waiting for his picks to develop. The low point player has been absolutely instrumental in allowing him to be able to, to push up the court there. Great race there from Riyadh. Obviously being one of the elder players in the, in the world game at the moment, but really showing what pace he's, he's had and got still. I'm not sure that's uh, a legal call. So what's happened there? So re there was an illegal use of hands. Um, so it was given as a penalty penalty try. Riyad thought that he was supposed to be going to the penalty box. Um, and there was a reset on the play because of the confusion. I'm not sure as there should be for um, what essentially is, is not game awareness. GB, Wouldn't you know? I'd, I, <laughs> that's I'd, the man who scores. I'd be really frustrated if I was GB with that one. So much game awareness required in wheelchair rugby. Over the top, Coggan collecting and set upon by even at Robinson working so hard, but Coggan so aware of where his high pointer was. And it's a great finish. The trio working all together. Oh, 
Almost. Almost pinched. Yeah, France are having to come really low to receive the ball at the moment. And then having to do extra work just to get over that half. Well, that being said, France are doing well at staying in touch. They're still only a point separating the sides. Although GB have the possession to make it too. Yeah, we've only seen one turnover so far this quarter and obviously GB want the ones with the upper hand on that. You get the sense that this match is slowly building to some crescendo. I think we've got some some fourth quarter coming up that could be a well, an absolute barn burner. Point for point, toe to toe. Four minutes of this third quarter remaining. Life difficult for GB to get away from their key. Well, not quite so difficult when you've got that power from Phipps. No, a little bit lazy there from Riyad on his defence. He was he was looking for the reach, looking to get his hand, hand in there, but Aaron just powering through it. So here, GB have dropped back, all the way back to the key. They're having so much success applying pressure high up on the court for the inbound. Why have they decided to drop back now? So GB will be looking to employ a number of different tactics at this tournament, and obviously they think key defense might be one of their strong suits. Uh, so dropping back just to see what they've got, see if they can work on uh, some, some different defenses. Obviously the ultimate goal this year is, is winning a medal and, and hopefully a gold at at Paris 2024, so they will be looking to test things. It might also be to give a couple of the guys on, on the court a little bit of a, a rest, um, let, them, let them bring back into a key, talk about what they're hoping to achieve on the next play, perhaps make some tactical changes. It's always a good reset point. So in essence, you, know, you can't be full court press at all times. Oh, well, you definitely can, but it, it's always good to have options and, um, and GB are looking to exploit some of theirs. Aaron Phipps, another man who puts his machine through the ring at. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's using my wheels at the moment as well. They've been they've been sat in a shed since uh, since Tokyo, so they like brand new. <laughs> Thirty two. 30. This one building nicely. France hanging in there. Real energy in all departments being offered by GB, but this little link up between Ivana and Salem is proving fruitious at the moment. Yeah, and it's been one of those combinations that France have gone to for a number of years. They've got masses amount of experience playing together. So it's good to see them still managing to pull some of that magic out of the hat now. Phipps surrounded. Robinson goes long over the top. Coggan, wow. An incredible pass to perfection. And points for Jonathan Coggan. Oh, he, Jonathan Coggan is one of the absolute stalwart of, uh, of wheelchair rugby GB. This, if he gets selected, this will be his sixth Paralympic Games, and and he is, he's just one of those athletes that never gives in. He is, he is the epitome of relentless. Not your, not your typical try scorer for GB, but no. certainly all his, all of his hard work creates the try scoring opportunities for others. Yeah, as the lowest points on the court, so he's a technically a 0.5 player, um, the least function, but what he does, always on the court at the right time, always in the right places, just, just opening up space and causing mayhem when he's on defense. I think, you know, 
understandably, you know, our cameras are always looking to pick up the tries. You know, that, that's where games are won and lost. But, you know, sometimes it's interesting to, to just watch the battles that are happening on the other section of the court. And you mentioned Jonathan Cog, and he is, he is constantly in motion, no matter what part of the court he's in, looking to create problems for opposition players. And a problem for France here is that GB have turned this over. Fitz to Robinson. Try time. Yeah, big, big turnover there for GB. Just France were running out of options. They had to pass to a low point player and, and Aaron was there to capitalise. Oh, it's, you could see his eyes bulging. Yeah, it's one of those ones you're almost seeing it as a high point player. You see it as a as a hospital pass that Jonathan's thrown his low pointer there, and and Aaron didn't quite line up the chair, but but he would have expected to uh, be sending that French player cartwheeling. Well, we could only see the back of his head, but I think he was licking his lips as that opportunity presented it yeah. to him. And I don't think it was um, a punctured tire. I think he's actually managed to. Um, to buckle his wheel, which is uh, quite an impressive feat. Wow. Thank God it's not your wheel. Yeah, absolutely. Right, four four hundred pound a wheel is uh, not not a cheap game. Wow. Big big bucks and big points at the moment. Yeah, GB nice stretching it out with three try lead. And as I mentioned, mentioned all through this tournament, uh, as you're getting towards the end of the quarter, um, teams will be looking to manage that clock. So GB will be desperate to score last goal this quarter. Very, very vocal sideline as far as the French are concerned. Lots of instructions being poured on as they register another try to the difference, one minute and 28 seconds on the clock. GB in possession. Yeah, Stu will just be looking to slow it down here a little bit. Looking for that optimum timestamp of around 50 seconds. Or uh, 105 in this case. Thoughts on that as a time to remaining of a quarter? Well, I mean, it means that both teams have still got two timeouts left. So perhaps they're they're worried that France might use a timeout if if they ran it all the way down to um, to 50. Oh, go on up. Even the fastest man. No, but it was it's a turnover, which is the most important thing. So France struggled to get out in in 12 seconds didn't have the possession of the ball so they couldn't call the time out um, and, and GB need to capitalise on this turnover a big ending potentially incoming for GB in this third quarter Phipps is off Flynn is on Walker is on Smith Passes to Robinson. So what I think GB will do here now is they'll run the clock down right the way to, to 15 seconds left on the game clock. Um, it then takes away France's chance to score a last goal. You can see. I like it when I'm right. <laughs> the three, three big sets of teeth grinning at each other, <laughs> knowing what one another's up to. And uh, three sets of players who've uh, they've got against each other on some big occasions. Yeah, so a good use of a tactical timeout there just to make sure that you get the last opportunity to score.
Right, GB with 11 seconds, as he said, looking to score, but looking to leave it as late as possible to deny France the opportunity. GB running it tight on the clock, and they miss the chance to convert. Yeah, they won't, won't be happy with that one. 15 seconds should be enough time. They'll have practiced that time and time again at, at training camp. So, yeah, they'll be they'll be frustrated with that one. But all credit to France. Managed to put on a really solid key defense and kept them out. Well, for a moment, for France, it looked like they'd be going in four points down. But as it stands, 37-34 and more than a glimmer of hope for the reigning European champions. GP just squandering that opportunity right at the death of that third quarter. Just hope from their perspective that's not going to come back and haunt them. No. No, I don't want to uh, jinx anything. No commentators, curses or, or any of the such from this corner. We really are watching the very best in the world. We're definitely watching the best in Europe in terms of France and GB would be the ones who would be contesting that it's them at the moment. That's what they are really battling out for on form in the quad nations. And well, this is the European champions doing what they do best in scoring tries and Shu Robinson who wasn't unable to unlock that French defence at the end. Has been very, very good so far across all three quarters and his partnership with Aaron Phipps has been working nicely. It really has. They, they, they came on there. They're, they're so strong, so powerful and, and they really need to be optimised. Any time they're on the court together, they need to be physically imposing themselves and, and that's what we've seen this afternoon. France, they're not far off, it, particularly with, in, with GB's failure to score right here at the dead. This is a big left hand coming through from Rodolphe Jarlin. Maybe that's just breathed a little bit of oxygen into the French hopes of a comeback. Yeah, and, and I, I'm, well, I, I believe it's a GB start looking at where Jack uh, Smith is set up looking at the court at the moment so GB coming out with the ball um, which is big points well could be that they go up by another point if they manage to convert this which means that that scoring that last goal of the of the ha half would have been really important it would have been a two goal swing for, for GB so so yeah they'll be reviewing that in the debrief later well, they absolutely need to make this one count. Leading by three. GB chasing a bronze medal. And in possession, nice weave from Flynn. And well worked into the arms of the captain and GB get their try. Verdun is back on and in the mix and bringing that upper body power, the big number 33. Yeah, definitely, definitely one of the fastest players in, in the world at the moment and it really showing what, what he brings to this French side. Robinson throws an interception to Ivanat and that mixes things up early in this fourth quarter. Yeah, a little bit loose there from Stuart. He won't be happy that he's managed to throw that one away. Hivene just must have been on his outside of his line of sight, and we've seen another turnover. Big start to this quarter for France. This is precisely what happened against Japan in the semi-final. France getting three turnovers in a row to really put Japan under the pump in the latter stages of the semi. 
They haven't got their second yet, but now they do as even at hooks up with Verdun. And all of a sudden, it's a one-point game. Although, GB have the possession. GB have the possession, yeah. So hopefully they'll stretch it out to two, but with France playing the defence they are at the moment. That pass had to be right on the money. Gavin Walker receives it back. And that two try lead reinstated. So yeah, so GB were looking to try and implement a key defence there, but see France were, were aware to it and then managed to pick back Gavin Walker after he scored the try, not allowing him back into the defensive set. It meant that GB didn't really know what defensive they were or play they were going to run there and uh, obviously France got the score. But in that process, they committed three players to lock up Gavin Walker, albeit even now was the free player. Is that you know, a customary tactic to have that one high classification player and back him against three defenders? You technically no, especially as Gavin is a, a two point player, so so they were they were at a loss for points on him. They'd have liked to have probably put the two low pointers on him, but but Sebastian Verdun had to do the work. Sebastian Verdun full of energy yeah he's had a little bit of time off in the last half so he's probably come back really fresh really wanting to make an impact fourth quarter GB 40 France 39 Stu Robinson almost gets snared pass asks quite a lot of Kieran Flynn he keeps his composure and then an illegal arm comes in and GB have the try yeah, really great composure there from uh, from Kieran Flynn. A relatively newcomer to the sport, but just showing what level of composure he has in these high-level games. Verda draws the foul from Gavin Walker. A little bit lazy from Gavin. He knew he was never going to catch him going backwards, so threw an arm out in the hopes that he could disrupt the wall, but finds himself in the naughty boy chair. It takes quite a lot of self-discipline to it, keep your arms to yourself sometimes. It does. I, I was on, um, on the, on the re yeah, receiving end of uh, verbal abuse from coaches for, for putting my hand in the cookie jar numerous times when I shouldn't have. Not abuse, telling off. <laughs> and rightly so, probably. I think so. I think uh, a coach's admonishment is necessary at times just to extract the best out of you. Yeah. A French flag bearing fan looking on anxiously as this bronze medal hangs in the balance. What a ball. That really was a perfect pass. Jonathan thought he had all the all the lanes covered, but threads the needle with that one to Stuart. Verdun. Verdun being pursued by Robinson. He does a great job of jockeying and delaying Verdun's progress to the line. And then Flynn's back there. Walker to Ivana comes steaming on from deep. Still, France, no try. 14 seconds on the clock. And that snaking cruising style of even at, even manages to blast through two chairs. Bulldozing his way through there. You didn't think there was a gap, but he made sure there was one. Well, there's that deception you were speaking about before because of the manner in which he generates pace. Right, left, right, left. It's difficult to know where, what way he's going to turn. It is, and it's a real strength in his game is, is he always keeps the chair moving. You never really see him stop. 
Um, so even when, when he looks stopped, there's always lateral movement, side to side, turning, so that when he does come out of the hole, he's coming out with pace. But while France are being made to toil for their tries, GB are flying up the other end and scoring with relative ease. Verdun gets a bit of attention from Jack Smith, but then he's off. And then the ball's in Ivanas hands. He's in for another try. 43 42. Four and a half minutes to go. Love that no look ball. Seeing the line that Stu Robinson was offering. We might, yeah, time out here. So, what Stuart was looking to do there was Gavin was to get a pick and roll, but they're, they're a little bit outmatched. Gavin being a two point player and the, the player marking him being a three point player, so we never really had the function to get away. Um, and GB wisely using a timeout in that instance. Their last timeout of the match. So no more get out of jail free cards. France have two. Jack Smith finds Robinson. And then works really hard to get around and create a pathway for Robinson who feeds it to Walker. Yeah, and, and once again, you're seeing the unsung work of what the low pointers do. Jack Smith there, absolutely instrumental in making that pick for, for Stewart to go up the court. They're point for point at the moment. You feel this is coming to a dramatic head. Those two turnovers for France early in this fourth quarter, really changing the complexion of this bronze medal match. Yeah, well, not the start that GB were, were hoping for. Um, they've they've regathered their composure and are now in a decent position. Well, they don't have any more timeouts they here, don't. and they need to get across halfway pronto, which they don't. Yeah, you do worry that France have started to figure out what this this strong GB lineup are doing and perhaps matching it tactically now. So, so maybe GB will need to look at making a change, switch something up. Just just keep France guessing. France have to use a timeout as well. Well, that was unexpected. Looks like they didn't have an inbound option. So, perhaps just going in now. Just just have a chat with the coaches. They just got a turnover, want to be uh, solidifying their position, so make sure all the players have got a calm head. As predicted, some changes rolling on for GB. Mr. Dependable, Jonathan Coggan, in alongside Aaron Phipps with the power and the pace. And the headband. And the headband. Always the headband. Feels like there's a, a missed sponsorship opportunity out there for that headband. Oh, huge. I've, I've once seen him throw it into the crowd after a game and, and the crowd has just parted like the Red Sea. <laughs> Don't think he was ever doing that again. Quite sort of WWE style, that. Yeah. Well, he's, 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 a, he's a big, strong guy and he sweats a lot. That, that is not a nice, uh, a nice sweaty headband to be coming at you in the crowd after a game. So, yeah, I, don't, I do not blame the crowd on that one one bit. Maybe that's an English thing. Maybe it'll go down well in Paris. Maybe. Wow, that's great defensive pressure applied by the sweaty headbanded man. And he'll be, <laughs> he'll be thanking us for this later, surely. <laughs> No, it was really good pressure there from, from GB. And, and like we said, we, they needed to make a tactical change, just, just switch something up, put France under a bit more pressure, and that's exactly what we've seen. And France, now they don't have any timeouts. Verdun to Ivanat. It is really stodgy out there. Look at that pick from Coggan, but Ivanat 
gets the ball away to Verda. And that's the joy of having a high-low offense. You, once you lock someone up, usually as an offensive player, you know there's going to be an outlet somewhere. And that's exactly what Verdun was there for, for Jonathan. Contact on the arm needs the France to be reduced to three for the next play. Yeah, Corentin Le Guin headed to the, the sim bin there. Smith to Phipps, to Robinson. Two huge attacking weapons on court for GB. And Robinson meanders his way yeah. through the French ranks. As GB have got a little bit of a power play here at the moment, they've just, just taken a couple of extra seconds. They don't need to, but, but they've got the points advantage, so making sure that they use all of them. Forty six forty five. Two and a half minutes of play and Phipps releases himself like a torpedo into Ivana. Cedric Nanka takes out Coggan and it's uh, an easy coast to cross for Verda. He must be in the conversation for the biggest arms in uh, in wheelchair rugby. I think as long as Chuck Oki's playing, there's uh, there's probably no competition there, to be honest. I, I wouldn't mind seeing an arm wrestle, maybe. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sebastian Verdain, he's one of those guys with a massive power to weight ratio and, and, and just delivers it so well. Beautiful transfer to Ivanat. Less than two minutes remaining. 47 apiece. And this clock management is more crucial than ever now for both sides. If GB and France keep trading tries, GB are the last to score. The bronze medal will be theirs. Jonathan Coggan. Phipps almost thought he was going to be accelerating through, then spins around and makes safe passage to the try line. Really unselfish there from Johnny Coggan. He, he knew that perhaps Sebastian Verdun was catching him up, so turned away from what was likely to be a try just to make sure and guarantee that it, that it was. Give it to his high point player. Less than 90 seconds to go. Even up on the ball and levelling things up, 48 apiece. Oh, Robinson rides that challenge, wheeling along. Yeah, and probably a, gathers himself and picks out Phipps. Probably a little bit unfair there on Stuart Robinson. Cedric Nankin definitely hitting the back of Stuart's wheel there. So. Stewart was expecting a foul call, which never came, but recovered his composure and got a brilliant pass away to Aaron. Well, they're working in tandem to harass Ivanat. He picks out Verna. They're running out of time here to get across the halfway. And that could be the turnover that seals the bronze medal. Huge turnover, brilliant defence. What you saw Aaron Stewart doing there was Every time they stopped the ball, they got back on top of the play, make sure whoever they passed to couldn't get over the half and, and forced a really tricky pass. Well, I'm not exactly sure where that ball is. Stewart's come up, trumps with it. Another turnover. They could just see out the clock if they wanted to. Big, big plays in the dying embers of a gripping bronze medal match. And GB aren't just going to see out the clock. They're going to finish with a flourish. A try with just over 14 seconds remaining. Two massive turnovers. Oh, huge in the context of this game, which has been incredibly close. Even that. 
won't leave Cardiff with a medal. The European champions will be bested by GB. And the bronze medal is theirs. What a game. GB have got to be happy with that one. Really shaky start the first quarter, but, but showed their class, showed their composure, showed that they're in a really strong position now heading into, into what is a Paralympic summer. Goodness me, and look at that togetherness. Immediately in all together as one. Yeah, straight away. The moment. Straight away. A hugely enjoyable bronze medal match there that was in the balance for all four quarters right until that last 60 seconds when two massive turnovers. Yeah, literally up until the last minute, it could have gone either way. I think France were really trying to force a turnover and, and it ended up hindering them. They they were the ones on the on the back foot right at the end there and, uh, and congratulations to GB, a really hard fought win there. Well, great applause and appreciation between the athletes and from the crowd here in Cardiff. They've really been treated to one hell of a European ding-dong there. And now they get to show added appreciation for the French team who played their part not just in this bronze medal match but just in an excellent quad nations that is yet to climax just yet we've got the gold medal match coming up next between the usa and japan but just to sign things off for these guys where does this leave france heading out of this competition and in really the biggest year of these players career yeah coming away from this fourth isn't exactly where they want it to be it's a home paralympic games for them but there's massive amounts of, um, well, they can take massive amounts away from this tournament. They played some exceptional rugby. They ran an extraordinary amount of lines. They've tested a lot of players. They've probably confirmed a few suspicions that they may have about weaker lines and stronger lines. So they'll be in a lot stronger position now going into the tournaments coming up. Uh, they've got Canada Cup coming up and obviously the Paralympic Games in Paris where they'll be really looking to make a statement. Well, here's how the quarter unfolded and it, it was really a brilliant one and one that France fought to get back into. This was a key moment right here. Yeah, the first we, of two back-to-back -back turnovers for France. It got them back into the contest. Yeah, we thought the momentum had switched, but but GB, in all fairness to them, they, they held their composure, held their nerve and uh, and in the end extended that lead. even at Supreme throughout much of this week and he'll have a huge part to play in Paris for the variety of attack and defence and personnel offered by GB ultimately proving too much. But look at this play, so many highlights from that French performance to admire. This long ball over to Phipps, pretty much sealing the deal. Before that intercept, put Phipps across to put it beyond any doubt. And GB take the bronze at the Wheelchair Rugby Quad Nations 2024. opportunity for us to pause and take a beat for a moment before we ramp things up again for the big one the gold medal match the Paralympic runners up from Tokyo USA 
up against the bronze medalists from the very same competition. Japan. It is promising to be a mouth-watering final. And one that is sure to delight the Cardiff crowds who are here in the capital supporting vociferously. Well, let's hear from a couple of gold medalists from that Tokyo Paralympics. My co-commentator for today, Jim Roberts, who is with GB's Stu Robinson. Hi, so uh, joined here with uh, Stu Robinson, man of the match performance for GB there. Um, Stu, give me your first thoughts on that one, and firstly, congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it was a tough match. It's always is a, a tough match against France. Uh, we know what they're going to bring, but uh, we have to bring our A game, and uh, we thought we'd try and liven it up a little bit by uh, a few turnovers and trying to make the score a bit more even, but uh, I'm glad we came out of the win. It showed uh, our determination, our resilience, but yeah, really glad we came out of the win. Yeah, you mentioned a few turnovers. Flagrant foul against Aaron Phipps in the first quarter. Set you down. What was said going into the end of that first quarter and, and what, how did you manage to recover? Well, we've, uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been working on our resilience and how we can work through things no matter what's thrown at us. And uh, yeah, obviously that was testament to that and seeing what, um, why we could come back from being three goals down from the, the flagrant. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad how we performed. Um, I know that we just looked to stuck at, stick to our patterns and stick to what we know. And yeah, luckily we uh, managed to come away with it. Well, congratulations on the win. Obviously now this is building up to a Paralympic year. What's next for the team? What's next for yourself in preparations for Paris? So we'll obviously go away, have a bit of a break, uh, a bit of a rest. Um, we have another tournament coming up in uh, June over in Canada. That'll be another uh, amazing tournament. Top six teams in the world are going to play against each other, but that'll be a, a good eye opener ready for, uh, for Paris. But yeah, it's a lot of time to get some rest and ready for the next tournament. Brilliant. Thanks for joining us, Stu. Congratulations on the bronze medal. Back to Joe. Well, great to hear from Stu Robinson, who, as ever, was a force of nature out there on the courts as GB delivered a bronze medal here at their home quad nations. So that is the bronze medal decided, but next up it is the big one. It is the gold, it is USA versus Japan, and that is coming momentarily. So pop the kettle on, but don't go too far. We have got a blockbuster of a gold medal match to come.
Welcome everybody. We're here at the Sport Wales National Centre for the climax of what has been three thrilling days of wheelchair rugby. The Quad Nations is coming to a dramatic climax. I'm alongside Tokyo gold medalist Jim Roberts and we are about to enjoy two of the best in the business. USA, the world ranked number one side against Japan who are perennially championship contenders. Absolutely, we're really excited about this game. It's been the culmination of what has been a really hotly contested tournament this week. Um, and, and rightly so, I think these two teams have, have outshone and, and are rightly in a gold medal winning position now. Now for, for those of a UK audience who are tuning in thinking, all right, we want to see GB. Well, they missed out on the semi-final to a, a pretty comprehensive USA side. But just to touch on them before we move on to the final itself, securing bronze against France. Very, very big for them to come up against the European champions and win that final match and lead this competition with a medal. Yeah, it was a huge game for GB to win. So, like you mentioned, France are two-time or back-to-back -back European champions. So, so getting one over on them was a big step for GB and, and puts them in good stead going into the Paralympics later this year. Well, for those of you that did miss that bronze medal match, we've got a little recap just to whet your appetite ahead of this gold medal one. Bronze secured for GB, a nice little lily pad on that journey to the Paralympics in Paris against the host France. But now we are looking at gold. We are looking at USA and we're looking at Japan. We're starting with the reigning world number ones who were the ones who defeated GB in that semi-final earlier this morning. And it is all about the return of Chuck Aoki. The, uh, the force of nature that wears five, but it would be unfair to dismiss the efforts of the others. And particularly, I have to say that Sarah Adam has stood out for her performance across the whole Quad Nations. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Sarah Adam has been a real in massive inclusion to the USA team. When they're running that Chuck Aoki, Josh Wheeler, Sarah Adam, gives them so many passing options on the court. So as a defensive team, you just don't know who you should be defending. Apart from those two players who we've picked out sort of strategy wise what what is the flavor that the usa bring to the core they bring a relentless defense so they're they're always cycling back they're always making sure they're on top of the play they'll all be pushing for each other but on offense they're really calm really collected you know there'll be a lot of passes and and passes that are clinical as well Relentless and clinical, a potent combo. That's why they secured silver at the Paralympics in Tokyo. And the team that secured bronze were the hosts, the Japanese, they're in red. And well, they have got a whole host of fabulous players. Ike Yukinobu, uh, number seven, Ikazaki Daisuke. But the, the man who really caught my eye this morning was Hashimoto the young man who came on scored a host of tries and is a real bull of a player out there on court. He really is, he's developed so much. So he was brand new at Tokyo 2020 and he has developed in the last three years, unbelievably. Moves his chair better than the most players out on the court at the moment. His lateral movement, side to side, jinky movements, really one to watch out for. And I think he's one a bright star for the future of Japan. Um, and, you know, we've, we've explored the, that, that precision, that relentless defence of the USA. What is the hallmark of Japan's game? So they are really clinical. Obviously, with Yukonobi Ike, they've got the massive, big presence. He's super tall in his chair, almost like a, a, a quarterback, just directs all of the play. So he'll have uh, Daisuke Ike running off him. He'll have Hashimoto running off him. Um, just, just incredible team. So 
a really huge match here and potentially a huge stepping stone on that journey to the Paralympics in Paris. And, and Jim, you know, you, you went to Tokyo, you came back with gold. These moments, these finals that aren't the big, big one, but they are important. You know, how, how big a role do they play in a team's development and their confidence coming into the biggest year of them all, a Paralympic one? These are massive in the development of a team. So we were lucky in, in the Tokyo year, obviously nobody could play, we had COVID. We had a deep enough team that we could play against each other, but a lot of these teams, they need to be able to test themselves. They need to come to tournaments like these, find out where they're good, find out where they're bad, things that need working on. And that's exactly what we're gonna see. It's an interesting one though, right? You, you wanna come away with the gold medal, but you, you're talking about the bigger picture and teams justifiably are thinking about that exploration of their options. They're talking about throwing players into stressful situations and seeing how they perform or mixing up the combinations of players. So how do you strike that balance in a final like this? Well, we've mentioned it earlier today. You don't know what's going to happen at the games. Players could get injured, players could get ill. So you need to know that you've got a deep bench enough of them to be able to sort of run any line that you throw out there. So, so this is what we're really stress testing. The coaches will be doing this week. Well, the lights are down, but the anticipation is up. Two famous flags in wheelchair rugby are out and fluttering, or still more so in the Sport Wales National Centre, which has been the most terrific of settings all this week for the return of the Quad Nations. Dale Thompson and Marcus Ross, the two men charged with keeping peace in the middle of a sport that thrives on collisions. Here come the Japanese, let out by IQ Kenoba. What an incredible player he is following suit. The rest of his charges, many of whom were in Tokyo for that home Paralympics. And Japan with lofty expectations of themselves and beginning to really re-emerge as a global force again who could well be mixing it in a gold medal match come this summer. Yeah, they've been, they've been world up there as ranked team, one of the best teams for a number of years. They were 2018 world champions, beat Australia on, a, on home soil. They were really favoured going into their home Paralympics. Um, Fortunately for, for me and the, and the rest of my GB teammates, we were lucky enough to knock them out in the semi-final, but, but they'll, be, they'll have uh, work that they think that's left undone and, and they'll be going after a big medal in, uh, in Paris. Our second finalist, Team USA. Led out by Eric Newby, and there he is, Chuck Aoki. And you can see just as they're rounding the corner, at pace as well onto the court, receiving a high five from their former teammate and now coach Joe Della Grave, who is really making his mark with this new blend of USA wheelchair rugby players. He really is, and he brings so much experience. From, from being a, a recent player, so he knows these players inside and out, knows them intimately, but he's got, he's such a student of the game and really be looking to impose what his game plan is gonna be on this, this final. The players are here, the scene is set. Gold and silver to be determined. But first, the anthems.
Two anthems known very, very well across the wheelchair rugby cosmos and a galaxy of stars as well amongst them. We're right by tight to the USA side who are getting revved up, high fives and roars all round whilst just an air of calm surrounding the Japanese. There's a few last-minute running repairs and adjustments to the chair take place. These are special moments before a final. They are. They're exactly what you want as a player. You want to be in these moments. You want to be feeling that you're, you're challenging for the championship game, and, and that's exactly what we're seeing right now. And also, for our two finalists as well, they've travelled a lot of miles to be here. This is no like minor feat, travelling from Japan, travelling from the USA to come over to Great Britain to come and take on this challenge of a competition with four of the very best in the world. Yeah, physically it's a massive challenge as well because we've had the best teams here. There's been no easy games for these teams. They've really had to work. They've, Like you said, they've travelled halfway around the world for both teams. So they've got to get over the jet lag. Then they've had to reset themselves and then come out and, and perform against three of the other best teams in the world. Well, danger zone from the Top Gun movie blaring out to set the scene and just raise that adrenaline amongst the spectators and the players alike. Ike out there about to compete and win possession for Japan. And we're underway in the gold medal match of the 2024 Quad Nations. Ikazaki. Ikazaki. A man on a try-scoring mission yeah, to trouble the scorers first. When he saw that gap develop, he just punched his way straight through it. Adam, who has been outstanding all week, links up with Wheeler to Aoki. Two familiar faces and names in USA colours and Aoki by sheer force of will carries himself to the try line yeah those big shoulders he's carrying they come in handy once or twice don't they especially when he's making holes that that have no right to be there i still want to see that gun off between him and verdan i think it's a, a close run thing oh, i think you're, you're dreaming <laughs> chuck chuck every day all day ikazaki in again japan doubling their total and momentarily re-establishing their lead but it's end to end at the moment so this is what we're seeing from usa they've got those three ball playing options and and so if you guard two of them there's always going to be a third free and, and that's what japan are going to struggle against i think using this this high low line well that is some ball from ike and ikazaki who have been doing that for decades now. Off goes Aoki in pursuit. 
this could be, if it's end to end stuff like this, this could be a very high scoring game. What, do, what is that sort of, oh, wonder who that's going to be awarded to. So they've given it to Japan. They think it's come off a of USA's player's hands, which I think is fair. Um, obviously, the defender managed to get a fingertip in there to disrupt Daisuke, but, but still Japan on offense. So the end-to-end -end nature, how does that impact fitness engine-wise on these players? Because it's a, it's a slightly different fitness, isn't it, when you're doing shuttle runs as opposed to kind of the grueling tussle of locking horns in well, in encounters like that. Yeah, look, to be honest, it's something I found a lot easier than the stop-starting nature of a really good defense is, is physically very taxing. So just doing shuttles, a lot of these guys could do that all, all, the, all game. Wheeler to Aoki. Easy scoring right now for both these teams. It is. Both of these teams got very, very strong offense. What we're going to see is, is who can figure out their defense first. Oh, Chuck Aoki. Like a thief in the night. First turnover of the game. And Ike back on the ball and They'll be really, really disappointed at what just unfolded there. Ikazaki bumps into Ike. Have a little bit of a discussion and Ikazaki straightens up and keeps it simple. Off goes Aoki. Imperius in the semi-final earlier, almost loses his balance due to the interjection of Agawa. Yeah, almost a spinning foul there, but you just see the strength that, that Chuck's got in his core. He knew that it was, he could ride that one out. What is it like playing against Ike Yukinobu? Because no one can receive the ball higher than him in the game. No, it's such an advantage that he's got. He, he just sticks his hand up there and you know that you're not going get, to get anywhere. But it's sort of judging when the passes are coming to him, perhaps not reaching up for all of them and then trying to pick your moments. So I've, I've been lucky enough to get a couple interceptions off him in my time, but, but he is a phenomenal asset to this Japanese side. He's so unique in the, in the qualities that he offers. He really is. There's no other team in the world that has a player like him. Uh, just the fact that he sat so high, you'd think it'd be a disadvantage. You'd think he'd be top heavy and, and fall over more, but he controls that chair beautifully. Oh, Ikazaki just drops the shoulder and shimmies past and then straightens, frees the ball away from any prying American hands. And there's certainly a formula to the way that Japan are attacking at the moment. Seven apiece. Yeah, Japan are really struggling to get a proper press on at the moment. Anytime they they double team someone, that person calls inbound and, and they're back to square one again. There's always seems to be an outlet for USA at the moment. Big ball over the top, stretching the USA in their backcourt. Wheeler arrives with real presence, and Ikazaki is in the mood for tries. He really is. He moves that chair so well. You don't know which way he's going, left or right, drops his shoulder. Dumps the clutch and he's away. Well, Agar was being a nuisance as far as Adam is concerned, but she squirms away, then darts back inside Ikazaki. So Japan there got called for four Four players in the key. You're only allowed three players in the defensive key zone. So Daisuke Ek was the, the last player to go in, so he's the player that has to go to the sim bin. 
you look to see USA try and capitalize on this for the next offensive play. So USA get the ball in play into the hands of Chuck Aoki and he's going to be in no rush. You see Wheeler now head off to the penalty box to try and mark out Ikazaki. So Daisuke is calling inbounds. It's not a usual set pattern for Japan, so this is where USA will look to try and disrupt. Well, it certainly worked for France because a few of their turnovers came from Ike being locked in, and it's a try. No, it's not. The ball goes the USA's way. So there's a holding foul called against Yukinobi Ike on against Jeff Butler. So USA get the turnover. Well, that's big in the early scheme of things. And it's beautiful, flowing passing play from the USA. But it might just come to an end now. Shot clock, plenty of time on there as Aoki looks to manipulate that ball and extricate himself from the clinch. Yeah, uses those muscles, just, just forces his way out of that tricky situation. Bit of pressure there on Ikazaki on his reception. And Ogawa takes out Chuck Aoki. Pretty emphatic from Kusaba as well to keep the passage clear for Ikazaki. He thunders into Aoki. It doesn't stick though. Still no way through for Aoki. Trying to use that raw power. So Japan had been called there for leaving the court. So number 11 for Japan was, was pushed out of bounds by Eric Newby for the USA. He'll have to now go and sit in the penalty bin for, for a minute or until USA score. You've really got to watch your back in this game, haven't you? You do. There's, there's so many things you need to be aware of as a player. Time shot clocks, game clocks. You've got 10 seconds to pass or dribble. There's also so many little intricacies that you're trying to get advantage, and, and we just witnessed one of them right there. And a little shot there of oh, Ikazaki, who has made the USA half of the court his own, really. Albeit his team trailing 11 points to nine right this very moment. Ikazaki, still no sight of the youngster. Hashimoto for Japan don't need him because this quartet is working rather nicely apart from the obvious difference in the score and the turnover yeah the luxury that Japan have got is they've got three very high point players so they're able to rotate them in a, in a, in a manner that they can then rest the other players USA forced to call a timeout there. Eric Newby was pushed into a corner, forced to call the timeout. So, a bit of a risky play from USA, but um, but he called the timeout, so they haven't lost anything. Now, those all have been tuning in to some of the earlier matches, and those who might who might have seen the flagrant foul earlier on of um, of Aaron Phipps contact at the back of the axle and. Um, um, I, Ike yep. careered into the back there yeah, so you're on the not, USA player, but he was all right to do so. As long as it's in a safe manner, so there, there has to be an element of danger, and this was, as a player, you were always a little bit frustrated. It was like, well, he, that was an, an illegal hit. The only the fact that perhaps some of the players are able to ride out of it meant that it, it doesn't look like it's got a, an element of danger, but that there definitely was there, and I think that's probably what Eric Newby was complaining a little bit to the referee. Um, but the referees obviously decided not enough danger to warrant a foul. Wow. 
absolute power from Aoki. So uh, there is beautiful subtlety to the way he plays the game, but there is also that real Route One primal manner in which he just blasts through the chair sometimes. Hashimoto is that young man we've been speaking of, of that sort of cannonball of a player. But he's also got the dexterity to weave around mm. back. He uh, hasn't 10 seconds without ten, dribbling. 10 seconds, no dribble, yeah. So in, in wheelchair rugby, if you're in possession of the ball, you have to pass or bounce the ball every t or within every 10 seconds. What we saw there was Hashimoto get a little bit flustered. He's still fairly new to the game, but that's that's an error that you wouldn't expect from a, from a game of this level. Oh, but a big play from Mike wins back possession. And that's so often the way in wheelchair rugby. You've just won a turnover. The emotions are a little bit high, a little bit hot-headed. Suddenly there's a mistake and the turnover back the other way. Japan will be grateful for that one. They need to, to make sure they convert this, though. Ike is just unmatched with that big right hand of his. And Hachimoto wastes no time at all on this occasion. You know, definitely a little bit of arrogance of use there from Hashimoto. Knew he was going one-on-one -on -one against Chucky Oki and, and absolutely backed his own skills. Threw a couple shoulders and went around the outside. Well, we see, we've seen him. We've seen him flex his character out on court a little bit today. And uh, it's been enjoyable. There's a, there's a bit of swagger to the way that he sort of goes around his business, his demeanour out there. He definitely does. He's full of confidence, which you love to see in a young player. And and, and Japan are obviously right in, in trusting him with uh, with running these minutes that he is. And, and yeah, love to see the confidence, love to see what he can bring. Well, this time he finds a locked door. So he tries to go down the side return. Access denied, and he's still surveying his options. So he saw Chuck he must have just touched the wheel over the, over the try line there, which meant it was a penalty try, rather than uh, Hashimoto just running in. But either way, I think it was, it was about to be a try. Again. How these referees do it, eagle-eyed, looking at so much out there. It's a bit of a wonder. Yeah, we used to have to referee in, uh, in, in training camps a little bit, and I do not envy the job that these guys have. It is a really tricky game to referee. Who, who was the worst ref out of the, the GB lot? Oh, I'd probably say myself. I'm, ve I'm very biased. <laughs> Timeout called by the USA, and that's with an eye on the clock. 13.8 seconds remaining of, wow, first quarter's gone in a flash, hasn't it? It <laughs> really has, yeah. I mean, this, this is a tactic that we saw USA employ against GB earlier today. So they're really focusing on scoring every last goal of each quarter. Whether they have to use a timeout to do that, they're not worried. They are making sure that they're scoring every last goal. opportunity for the USA to go into those half-time huddles. 14-12 to the good. Wow, they've left a little bit of uh, meat on the bone there. 6.2 seconds. More than feasible yeah. for Japan. So a US player was pushed out of bounds there, which meant a turnover. Six seconds for Japan to try and score. So not only have USA not scored, but Japan could go the length. They're going to run out of time here with Hashimoto. Yeah, when, when there's that little time left on the clock, the ball has to be coming in higher. You've got to give yourself every opportunity to advance that ball and, and just left Hashimoto too much to do there. Wow. 
First quarter gone in a flash and it's the USA leading by a whisker, 13 points to 12. Yeah, the game's definitely developed as well. So we had really strong offense early doors. Neither team really knew how to put a defensive press on, but as the game's advanced, you can see more defensive plays coming in and, and yeah, it's a much tighter game. Ikazaki in buoyant mood and wow, a really uncharacteristic error from Japan's main receiver, Ike, from that inbound. Didn't hold the scoring of Ikazaki, who I assure you, someone else did score in this quarter, but such was his dominance in terms of tries for Japan. Yeah, he was really making that, an effort to push, push around the US players. Daisuke, one of the fastest guys. He's been playing a long time now and really making his dominance known on this court. Well, his replacement, Hashimoto, in the, in the tries as well. But the key statistic is USA have got one more. And they lead early in this gold medal match. Two minutes, not an awfully long time to translate a lot of complex messages. What, how much did you get as a player from these small breaks in the quarters? Well, you, it depends how the game's going, but you do get massive amounts. So the coaches might have picked up something that you haven't been, been noticing on court. And, and just to get those key messages back across, everyone knows the game plan or they should know the game plan. It's just reaffirming those key messages, make sure that people are on task. Japan with eyes on a gilded prize here in Cardiff at the Quad Nations 2024. Ike has left the court and Hashimoto Ikazaki and just taking a look. Daisuke Ike. Kurahashi as well. Yeah. Are onto the court. For debt for the USA, add them back into the mix and getting us underway. Eric Newby with nine on his jersey. The ordinarily ever present Chuck Aoki remains. Karahashi looks to make a nuisance and it's a turnover right from the get go. Hashimoto gobbling up the loose ball and finding Ikazaki. What a start to the second quarter. Yeah, uncharacteristic there from USA. So didn't manage to score the last goal of the quarter and turn over straight away. So that's a two goal, two try swing to Japan. Adam picks it up deep. So struggle to get round Hashimoto, but that's a nice little bit of sneaking work. Newby back to Adam Hashimoto, glass chair to chair. Very nicely worked in the end. Well, that is a blown tire. Yeah. For, the, for those of you who heard that, we run tire, <laughs> pressure tires at around um, 120 to 150 PSI. So what you heard there was, was Chuck Aoki's tire walls giving out and the tube just popping. I've had that happen to me once or twice in the car on the motorway. It sounds like a gunshot going off. It's terrifying. I mean, it's, it's loud in here. I, I can only imagine how loud it is in a car. Yeah, l l luckily kept the car in the, in the lane, but, but yeah, set the heart rate racing, I know that. <laughs> Here we go. USA have still got this lead, but really, they should be a lot further ahead. Japan have rallied either side of the break, and Hashimoto and Akazaki are forming a fruitious friendship out there on court. Newby on the inbound. 
lots of movement. Aoki frees himself up, dishes it to Adam. Almost, almost an arm coming in on Adam. And instead, she safely transitions it to Aoki. Yeah, getting very close to that 12 seconds, getting across the half as well. That was a tough offensive set from USA. Japan must be happy with how their defense is shaping up at the moment. Oh, Kurahashi did really, really well to afford an awful lot of room to Hashimoto to go coast to coast. And that's over and back call on Chaka Oki. Flirted with that halfway line and came up, came up not miss it, making it. So yeah, another turnover to Japan. Brilliant start for them in this quarter. And here we go, Hashimoto is there with Kurohashi and it's Kurohashi there doing some of the less celebrated work and then Hashimoto Swerving in. 15 all. The USA's lead eroded. Lee Fredet making trouble for Hashimoto. Not sure what the referee is called here. Four in the key. Clayton Brackett's been called for four in the key. So you're only allowed three defenders within the, the key defense zone. And uh, USA on that occasion had four. Clayton's the one that has to pay the price. I can assure you that Clayton, Chuck, and the rest of the USA cohort are not in agreement with that call. No, and I, I can't say I disagree with them. I, I definitely, that. so one of USA's strongest assets is their key defense, and, and they switch in and out really well, so, so they, they'd be annoyed to, to know that they had four in the key there. All right, this match has really come alive in this second quarter as far as Japan are concerned. It's a fingertip stretcher and it asks too much of the extremities and it's a turnover for Japan. Yeah, it's a, it's a lineup for Japan that has got so much pace. USA are really struggling to, to find the outlets at the moment and when they, they are a great passing team but Hashimoto and Daisuke are, are just causing absolute carnage out there. High fives all round for Kurohashi, who exits the field of play and brings in Hasegawa. Ike's back on. Hashimoto takes a rest. Ikazaki charged with being the chief try scorer once again. Well, you talk about that key defense. Ikazaki thought about going over the top, but thought better of it. 16 seconds on this shot clock. Ike with that big telescopic grip of his. I don't know how you defend. Like, that was a phenomenal piece of defense from USA, and no other team in the world would have been able to score that try in, but just having Yukonobi Ike there with that, as you put it, telescopic arm, just, just unstoppable. Well, USA shifts swiftly down the court to register a try of their own. They started up in this quarter. They're trailing now. And Japan, well, they're not quite in because Aoki's got too much pace for Norimatsu, who wisely dishes it to Ikazaki. Ike's on call to advance them further. Oh, 
goodness me. Just a momentary lapse in concentration from Ikazaki, who then, in his haste to rectify the error, sees himself go to the penalty box. Yeah, we've seen USA bring back on their starting line. So Chuck Aoki, Josh Wheeler, Sarah Adam and Jeff Butler. It's a really strong defensive line. And they were putting all sorts of pressure on Japan there. And it just a really uncharacteristic error led to a turnover. Well, they've kind of done the hard work, hadn't they? They'd ridden out that defensive storm and then it was, well, there was no pressure on it. They really had, yeah. It was it was perhaps a little bit flustered, heart rate's going, and, and, and that's when the, the errors can creep in. Wheeler eventually converts and we're level. A turnover, heavy opening couple of quarters, and oh, there might be one more. Ikazaki arrived just in the nick of time, and a timeout called. Yeah. Maybe even a little bit hasty there on the timeout. It, yeah, the inbound wasn't wasn't great. They they rushed it, but at the same time, they did have seconds on the clock. They they might have been able to progress a bit further up the court before burning that timeout. Well, the good news for Japan is it's their first one that they've used. USA have already burnt two. Ikazaki darts inside, straightens up, surveying his options. Oh, flowing. And it's difficult for Japan. So USA are retreating back to the key so well. They're leaving it. Obviously, Japan in, in two decisions, what they should be doing. Ikazaki's not going to make life easy for Adam. But that hit isn't enough to unsettle her. No, but she's really showing her pace there. Daisuke is one of the fastest players in wheelchair rugby, and, and she beat him in a straight-up race there. Whether that's saying that Daisuke is perhaps getting a little bit tired, maybe Japan should look to make a change, and I think it'd probably be, be him if I was the head coach to take off. Point for point, three minutes and 21 seconds remaining of the first half. Japan leading by one. Butler for the inbound. Adam showing strength and balance too. And oh, she moves wonderfully across the court, doesn't she? Yeah, it's such a strength in this USA line. They've got three great ball handlers, all with amazing speed. How, how Japan defend it is, is, is really the, the difficult question that they need to be asking themselves. And it is worth highlighting the fact as well that in wheelchair rugby, you're allowed a maximum of eight points as per the classification of a player's functionality on court. However, with a female player, you are able to have an extra 0.5 in essence. So in terms of the mismatches available, when you've got Sarah Adam on the court, something that the USA are able to exploit. Yeah, exactly that. They're able to play basically half a, half a point more function than they would be if, if it was a male player. Um, and, then, and obviously USA utilizing that really well. That is, an, that is an incredible ball. That's like watching a pro golfer chip one over a bunker and drop it dead by the pin. It, it really is, and, and, and it didn't have to be that risky. Like You're passing to the tallest guy in, in the world in, in terms of wheelchair rugby and made it almost difficult, it looked, but, but at the same time, easy. What a take from Adam. Pincered both sides and reaching, made it look easy. Brings Aoki in. And Wheeler finishes. 21 all, approaching that golden two minute mark where eyes begin to burn at the clock. Yeah. 
smartly worked easy. Yeah. Looks easy sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm not sure if Japan are quite aware of the clock yet. We'll look now to see if USA can realise what, what, what timestamp they're looking to hit. What would you be going for here? Uh, so we used to be about a 130 or a 135. Is, it would be optimal, I think, in this situation. But but each teams have different preferences on when they want the, the time clock to be. Well, they may not. They may not have a choice in quite how they can choose the time. 123. And Aoki scores the levelling try. Yeah. So if I if I was Japan now, looking to be around 50, around 55 seconds, something like that. And you see here USA immediately dropping back into that favoured key defence. And Japan. And Daisuke Ikazaki looking for the best way to unlock that key defence which they do so on the edge. Not scoring quite as close to the 50 as, uh, as I perhaps been, been wanting to, but we'll see what, what the end of the quarter brings. Wheeler races downtown, Adam on hand. She goes over the top, Aoki receives. 44.9 seconds on the clock. Yeah, so if Japan take all of that 40 seconds, it'll still leave USA around five seconds to score. There's still quite a tall order to go end to end in 4.9 seconds. I think there's a, there's a number of players here that can cover the court in, in five seconds, six or under definitely. EK is taking plenty of that time. Ikazaki continues to toy with the USA and Wheeler hurries things along. Yeah, 6.3 seconds. Let's see if uh, USA can pull one out of the bag. Almost an intercept. Yeah, almost surprised Daisuke there when that ball was coming. I think if he'd uh, been a little bit more aware, it might have been a catch rather than a a stab at it. <laughs> Onto the cord and into play. Second ticking down. Flipped out the back. To Wheeler, who doesn't quite get there. Huge intervention from Ike right at the death. USA denied, and Japan carry the most slender of leads into halftime, 24-23. Brilliant block there by Sayer, just at, just at the end, just to deny Josh Wheeler sneaking in in that corner. If he hadn't put that hit on, I think Wheeler might have sneaked that one. Well, yeah, it was Say Sayonori Matsu, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I uh, credited that to Ike Yukinobu. But Nori Matsu, the man with a big, big hand in the outcome of that quarter. So we're halfway through this gold medal match. It's Japan leading. Got a real contest on our hand, as expected. This was the fast start, wasn't it? It was an uncharacteristically sloppy ball from the USA and Japan punished them ruthlessly. So yeah, we haven't seen quite as much of uh, Haramatsu as, um, as I thought we would have in this game. He's been really, really strong all tournament. So perhaps Japan just, just favoring their more experienced lines at the moment. Well, Adam has continued to show up just as she's done. And that was, yeah. that was an exquisite ball, wasn't it? As you said, yeah. high-risk stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, they probably had about three feet to play with if he put it just that little bit higher, but threaded the eye of the needle on that one. Right, time for our players to recharge the batteries. And for us to do the same, and I'd encourage you to, because we have a full-blooded high-octane final two quarters to come that will determine the gold medal winner of the 2024 Quad Nations.
Here we go. Just two quarters of quad action remain of a thrilling three days. And two quarters lying between Team USA there in white and this Japanese outfit in red leading by a point. But I, I asked you this in a more informal manner when we were just off air, Jim, but I'll just, I'll just put you on the spot now. We're back live. Who's going to win this? I, uh, I think USA will, have got the strength and the depth in the bench to come through, but I would not be surprised if this went to overtime. These teams are slow, hotly matched. So it, like even even Stevens all around. So, so it really does. Who holds the nerve? Overtime. We haven't had one of those today yet. Could it be prophetic? No, I don't think we've had one all tournament actually. So, so yeah, it would make for a, for an interesting conclusion to this game for sure. I recall an, an overtime for you and USA in a Quad Nations a few, uh, well, a few years ago. I think we went to about four overtimes once and you did. unfortunately ended up on the losing side of it. But, but yeah, what, a, what an epic game that was. I think that may have been my first ever game of wheelchair rugby that I commentated. Oh. So, uh, yeah, good, uh, good game to get hooked on. Yeah, absolutely. Right, here we go. Japan and USA getting across the paint nice and early, getting that feel good try scoring feeling and oh that was that was close from Chuck wasn't it? Eagle eyes there from the referee so so you saw the ball dislodged from Daisuke Ike, uh, Chuck, Chuck getting his hands in there and I think um, probably a fair call. So Chuck Aoki spends a bit of time on the sideline. Hashimoto is on, wearing 32. And Chuck Aoki is going to be forced for the inbound here because he's not being man-marked, he's being too man-marked by Hasegawa Yuki and Ogawa Hitoshi. So he puts his arm up, he says, yeah, I'll go do the inbound because Hashimoto has done the business and added the score. Japan lead by two. And the tricky inbound really wasn't too tricky in the end there as far as USA are concerned because they're already up in the Japanese half of the court. Yeah, it's one of those, it's, we've mentioned it before, but it's the beauty of this USA line. Three really good ball handlers. So they've always got someone to inbound to. And they've always got someone to pass to. Really tricky to defend. Hashimoto receiving from Ogawa. And Hashimoto just goes through the gears, picks out Ikazaki. Nice and easy. Adam. Locked up there by Ogawa. Now she's free. Timing of the pass. Wheeler arriving on the scene. Oh, there are about three passes in that passenger play that were very 50 50. <laughs> Timing of the hits almost perfect, weren't they? Oh, they were. Just if the J Japanese players had thrown their hands in the air a little bit higher, they might have got an interception there. Well, here they are. Boom. So Daisuke Ikazaki getting a wheel change there. I think Jeff Butler was the, the culprit that managed to burst his tyre. What are these chairs like to manoeuvre around in compared to, to your everyday chair? Oh, they, they really are like it's going from, a, from a, a bus almost to a sports car. There's that much difference. Not very good on your average street because of uh, obviously the casters all the way around, but manoeuvrability is, is second to none. You really feel like you're, you've suddenly got an extra 
10 miles an hour in you when, when you can get to push one of these chairs around. Not cheap though, each chair is, is touching on 10,000 pounds at the moment with a set of, set of spare wheels. Yeah, they're really expensive sport. And, wow. that, and that's an increase even from when I was playing. So, so yeah, cost, cost of living crisis, feel, feel for these athletes. And, and a lot of the high point players will probably be getting through a chair in around two years. So can be an expensive sport. Can that sometimes be a barrier for people looking to enter the sport? Definitely, if, if you look at the Paralympics, the main teams that, that are competing are the developed nations, ones with a little bit more financial support uh, and backing. You, you don't see any third world or developing nations um, really competing in any wheelchair sports. And that's, you know, that, that cost is, that's going into kind of the level of engineering at the basis of these chairs. Because with the greatest respect, you know, you, you look at them and you, you, they're so battered and bruised and and worn they, they really well they look like warriors chairs but they do they probably belies some really fabulous engineering that goes into them yeah and all of these chairs will be completely bespoke made to measure for each individual athlete so and it'll probably take an athlete three or four chairs before they're really comfortable with the setup so yeah you can you can spend the first probably four or five years of your career just trying to dial in a chair setup There we go. There's a little bit of a brutal inspection of Chuck Aoki's courtesy of Vicky Zaki. And well, then he picks out his man, Clayton Brackett. He's onto the court. It's just an, it's an incredible innate awareness of, of where everyone is. And here we are seeing running repairs to one of those burst wheels there, courtside. The engineers working just as hard, maybe not quite as hard as those out on court, but certainly it's a busy part of the building. Oh yeah, Chuck French, the, the USA mechanic, he'll be fully aware of what his duties are on that bench. He's gonna be picking up fallen players, but his main role is to repair those, those punches, keep the chairs rolling. Get to see an absolute race there. Ah, oh, Hashimoto. Really flexing up to Chuck Aoki, introducing Aoki to the next generation. Hashimoto colliding with Josh O'Neill and before you know it Japan are up the other end of the court and they're about to clock up 30 points and the USA coach Joe Delagrave an ex-teammate of mine Phoenix Arizona he's a real student of the game and um, well what they've lost as a player, they've definitely made up for as a coach. Brackets with another score. What was that like playing out in the States? Oh, it was amazing. Um, the competition over there at the time was, was really high. There were a lot of really um, well-known well internationals playing over there and, and sort of where I developed my skills in playing wheelchair rugby and I can't, I can't thank people like Scott Hogshead and Joe Delagrave and Nick Springer enough. They they really taught me the basics of the game. Your so your development was that was that physical development or or more tactical now? Oh, tactical nice fully. I think GB have always been in a really strong uh, physical place. We've had really good sports science, really good um, strength and conditioning coaches, but just that tactical tactical awareness that I I developed while playing under Scott was was second to none. Here we go. A few fresh faces onto the field. Akamachi, one of them. Ike, we all know and love. With that wingspan of his. And Ikazaki is all boxed in. He has to go long. He invites the chase from Nakamachi, who loses the race. Yeah, a little bit of a loose pass there from Daisuke. Would you have used the time out there? Japan have got three. I think he didn't quite grab the ball in time to call the timeout. If I was Daisuke, I think he probably should have called the 
the timeout earlier, but but he thought he had the option on. So bit of a bit of a 50-50 call there. Poor poor pass from Dyson K. He, he he'd be upset with himself that he didn't make that one. 50-50 call leads to a 30-30 match halfway through the third quarter. Ike, the old stager, onto the court, picking out his wingman of decades. Yeah, and we haven't seen Daisuke Ikazaki have a break this, this whole game, so Japan are really sort of pushing his limits at the moment. And maybe that fatigue coming to pass. Yeah, I mentioned it a little bit earlier in, in this quarter or last quarter, I think. But, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm surprised not to see him taking a break, which, which he is now. And here we go. That was the rushed and misjudged pass from Ikazaki. And another concession of possession. It's sort of really flipped the dynamic of this match here for the gold medal. But look, Jim, I, I watch plenty of games where you play pretty much every second of the match. Yeah. And, you know, how, I mean, you know, it's just some days where you're in the zone, you're in the mood, you're red hot for the for the duration and you're not going to no. come off. So Japan, they, they have three high point players and, and always have. So they've, they've always been had the luxury that they could rotate. For a long time, I was GB's only high point player until the introduction of, of Stu and Aaron, which really added another dynamic to our game. I, I was used to running a lot of minutes, so sort of conditioned and, and built my whole strength and conditioning around that. Um, oh, big turnover there for Japan. Massive, real momentum shifter as well, just as you felt the tide was turning and Hashimoto is the master of that tide right now. Also, just going back to an earlier point, um, uh, Daisuke Ikazaki's probably got about 20 years on me, so um, so yeah, I, I'd, I'd expect him to take in a little bit more breaks than I did. He looks younger, if I'm being honest. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Josh Wheeler <laughs> skates across with 31 apiece, with three minutes and a bit of change from the conclusion of the third quarter and Ike is a long way from safety at the moment. Yeah. Time out called under immense pressure there. Really, you know, I say squeezing Japan these last few minutes. Yeah, so the, the, the interception that Japan got really was a surprise. USA seemed to have the ascendancy, so, so seeing that, that turnover, I think it was just a, a loose pass, but, but really helping Japan out at the moment because they seem to be under the, under the cosh. Sometimes it's simple, go straight and go fast. Yeah, and that, and that was a really smart play. So he, he was really slow, coasting out, letting the play develop. As soon as he saw that he had an opportunity, he put the hammer down and just went for the gap. Wheeler in for another score, in for another leveller. These two chasing each other around the scoreboard at the moment. Ike goes cross court. Oh, Hashimoto showing such athleticism. Oh, almost <laughs> clipping the cone. Yeah, he did his level best. Must have just got his front two casters over the line before he uh, he touched that cone. What an effort from Chuck, and he hasn't had a single single minute off yet this quarter. So. So he's really showing how, how fit that guy is. He, he did have Tuesday off. He did. It, I, I don't think that was uh, by by his own own choice, though. Chuck Chuck would be expecting to run a lot of minutes, and I'm sure he's conditioned himself that that he'd be uh, be happy to do so. Wow. Really tight, precise, close quarter exchanges of the ball between the USA players and. The final one from Aoki, a peach into the arms of Adam. The 
transfer from Ike is so far sometimes that with his back to us, you thought he'd lost it. Yeah, and the, and the referees are really sort of hurrying up the inbounds there. You notice he put the ball on the ground, started moving his arm, so he'd already started the count. He's not not for any messing around, waiting for them to set up their ideal condition. So, so yeah, really, really good um, adjustment there from Ike. Surveying the options and coming together. Sees Wheeler upended. You can't see it from this angle on the screen, but he's got a, there he is, huge grin. Big grin on his face, yeah. <laughs> All part of the fun. Yeah, Josh Wheeler, he's one of those players. He's been around a really long time. I think London 2012 was his first Paralympic, so he's been to every, everyone since and, and medalled at everyone. But but he's got his chair set up so finely that that those those really rapid turns that he does sometimes can up, upset the balance. Hey, okay. With 18 seconds on the shot clock, pirouettes. Looks for a gap. Oh, well. He's had an arm in there from Ike. Not called, but it's a try nevertheless. Yeah, and it was like you said, just the pirouettes. Did it, did it magically. <laughs> 34 all. One minute and two seconds left of this absorbing third quarter. And 59 left there now. To the USA to play with trailing by one. Yeah. So the USA have got one timeout left. It would be interesting to see if they try and use that this just to close out this quarter with the last goal. Or are they going to be dispossessed? Ooh. Yes, they are. Hands in front of Newby. An ill advised delivery from Aoki. And Japan strike late in the third. That's huge. Yeah, almost looked a little bit lackadaisical there from USA. It was the first time we hadn't re seen real intent on, on getting out of the half. So, And we're seeing a wheel change there from uh, Eric Newby as well. I hope that wasn't uh, one of the reasons that, that they got dispossessed. Here's that turnover again. So it's the ball for Aoki and yeah, just just being worked upon, pincered yeah. from both sides. It made it uncomfortable. Yeah, it was outside of his cylinder. So yeah, difficult difficult catch to make. But all credit to Japan there, getting a crucial turnover. Ogawa, one of those in there making the big difference, and he's working hard on Aoki again as well alongside Hasegawa. Aoki's managed to shake them off. 15 seconds. Two points the difference. USA desperate to score late here in the third and drain the clock as much as possible. But 8.9 seconds, this is something to work with for Japan. Yeah, easily doable for a team with this much speed on the court. And here is their main speed merchant, Hashimoto. Looking to turn Aoki inside out. Sees a hole. Oh. Ooh. And they're coming together. Not entirely sure what the referees are going to call here. Because Hashimoto turned away at the last second, I think if he'd have kept kept heading for the for the try line, they might have given a penalty try. Josh Wheeler left the court at the very last second, so not sure what they'll add on to, onto the shot clock here. Pivotal moment late in this third quarter. Could have only been 0.02 seconds at most. Well, if they end up with an inbound, you, play, you, you, 
you're throwing the Hail Mary to Ike, surely. Yeah, you, he's, that's, that's what he's doing. He's sat in the key for a reason. He's positioning himself yeah. in anticipation. Yeah. So hard to defend, but also you've got to be pinpoint accurate with that pass into him. Well, a referee has spoken to the USA bench and Joe Delagre seems content, so you'd imagine it's not a penalty try. Yeah, not a penalty try. Hashimoto definitely turned away from his scoring opportunity, so... So, yeah, In interesting substitutions. Obviously, USA have brought on Mason Simmons, uh, their tallest player in the, in the option. He can at least put a hand in front of Yukinobi Ike. So, in terms of time on the claw, EK, what a claim. Wow. Pinpoint delivery and the pouch from the big man. Wow. What a play that was. There, there are not many teams in the world that can do that. And, and yeah, absolutely clutch moment there from Japan. An incredible conclusion to that absorbing third quarter. Wow, what a final we've got here. There's two points in it, but Japan getting a crucial one right there in the death. That was amazing. Yeah. Just stretches their lead out. Like you said, two try lead. I'm pretty sure it's USA. They're going to be starting the fourth quarter with the wall. So, so instead of having a tie game, it, it still means that Japan are able to keep that, that lead advantage. USA 35, Japan 37. And Japan in control. But they've hardly got both hands on the reins. It is a, a very rough ride for both sides. They're battling tooth and nail for absolutely everything. And there's been real sort of purple patches and swings of the pendulum of momentum throughout that quarter there has there's definitely been some ascendancy in the in the defense of each team sometimes you're thinking usa have got a little bit on top and then other times japan have, have really looked dominant but but for the most part both of these teams offense has been flawless So this was a big moment. This is just when USA were looking to strike towards the end of the quarter. And then this moment, this bit of brilliance, not just from Mike, but the delivery as well. Yeah. Yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal last play of the quarter. Would have, would have loved to have that sort of weapon in, in uh, GB's arsenal as well when I was playing. But, but yeah, you've got to, got to use what you've got. In terms of, in terms of the height of Ike in that chair, can you explain the di the dynamics of that? Why he sits so much higher than everybody else? Yeah, so it, it um, so due to his disability, he's had some uh, effects where he can't bend the the one remaining leg that he's got. So he has to have it fairly straight in his chair, which means as a result he does sit quite high. Um, obviously, when you're playing wheelchair rugby, the main thing is is your pushing ability. So it does hinder his speed a little bit sat that high, but what it offers him in terms of his height and his reach and, and just distribution skills are, are, are unmatched. They really are. Distribution skills and a pretty handy strike, man. When you've got 0.24 seconds on the clock. USA. will be relieved that they had the possession to start this fourth and decisive quarter. Yeah. And they score with it. Bring bring the game back to within one.
for once. The big man's grip deserts him and he was all snarled up by Butler and Wheeler so he couldn't scramble to salvage it. It was, yeah. Just, just as we were singing his praises, we've uh, commentated his curse. Very rare mistake from uh, Yukonobi Ike there. He makes up with it. Yeah. With a no look over the shoulder, one bounce pass to Nakamachi. Insane skill set. Oh, and oh. a turnover. That was really aggressive defense from Dicey K. So he knew the ball was going in Sarah Adams and he just hit her enough from behind just to throw her off the, the banks that she was expecting. It ended up coming off her chair. Wow, it's really stepped up a notch as Wheeler crashes into the back of Ike. Yeah. And you can see just those couple of minutes that they were able to give Dicey K a little bit of a break. He's come back on, fresh, energised. He looks a different player. You talk about, you know, that luxury, that, that positive of having two high classification players. Sorry, three high pointers, I beg your pardon. It's not like their powers of diminished when Hashimoto was on the court. No. No, so and it just keeps them fresh, keeps them keeps them firing and uh, yeah it's, it's a massive attribute that Japan look to utilize a lot so surprised they didn't do it earlier but turn over to USA so a rare one that we don't see that often in um, elite level wheelchair rugby so Yukonobi Ike actually came within the meter of the inbounder so there should always be a clear meter from where the, the inbounder throws in the ball um, and her own player went into that then. A lot of pressure on this inbound. Massive shot coming in from Ike, who's got to be in his bonnet after being penalised for that one metre violation. 28 seconds, loads of time for Chuck to pick his spot but not loads of room until he forces his way through. Nakamachi picks out Ike and receives the pass back. Nice little flow between these two at the moment. And Nakamachi is flying down the left edge, gets spun. Yeah. Nothing so too grave. No, so that's one of those ones where Chuck can probably be a little bit hard, feel a little bit hard done by. So there was no real element of danger there, but it was enough that it was perhaps impeded the play. Well, be that as it may, he'll head to the penalty box just out of shot. And Japan will be able to, well, well assumedly, add another point and also manage their next defensive set as well. Ike on the ball. Off goes Agawa and Hasegawa out of shot to mark up Chuck Aoki. Yeah, wouldn't wouldn't be surprised to see Chuck Aoki inbound this next ball as they've they've locked him locked him up in the penalty box. But what USA have done already, they've already set up Josh Wheeler in a receiver position. He's got protection, he's got Jeff Butler. So they, they won't be phased by having Chuck have to inbound. Japan leading by one once again. USA's powers really undiminished despite Chuck Aoki being on the inbound. Good ball over to Adam. Level at 40s. Ike releases Hashimoto. It'll be a coast in for him. Yeah, those are the ones that you hate when you're on defense. Just a simple ball over the top. You've done all the work to stop Yike being the ball handler, and then your teammates have let you down and let, let, let Hashimoto just run free. So, heartbreakers for the rest of the team.
lazy little bit of defense there. Knew he wasn't in the right chair position. Stuck an arm out and got caught for it. Ogawa Hitoshi banished to the penalty box. Adam having to go the long way around. Aoki, no one at home in the backcourt. For Japan, nice and easy for Chuck, 41 all. He did mention overtime in the last quarter in terms of potential, Jim. I did, we're, we're on for it if it stays like it is, but um, there's still plenty of time left in this game. Either, either team could, uh, could grab this one. Hashimoto, he's got great balance as well, doesn't he? Yeah, just showing his absolute speed there as well. Going around Josh Wheeler and Sarah Adam. Agawa coming across to make life difficult for Adam. Oh, that's great. Skill at pace. Slaloming through the challenges of the Japanese jerseys. Yeah, she's really been a revelation for this US team of le in the last couple of years. Sort of really worth her points on court and, uh, and is demanding why she needs to be in this, this main lineup for USA. Gosh, she nearly pinched it from Hashimoto, who did outstandingly in the end to find Ike. And on this occasion, Japan delaying scoring. What, what's the rationale there, Jim? To be honest, I'm not entirely sure why they uh, they did that one. Perhaps they're just hoping to eat up a little bit of the clock, frustrate USA a little bit. They know they've got the, the slight goal advantage, so perhaps, perhaps just, are they already starting to manage the clock? It would be a little bit far out for me, but, but maybe that's what they're looking to do. Ah, oh, Hashimoto. Oh. Gets a sticky paw in between the hands of Wheeler. And that is a massive turnover with four minutes of the match remaining. That is, at this point in the game, that, that turnover could be huge. Well, Nina Ozid as well, celebrating. Big grin, pumping the arms. Yeah, you got to, you've got to celebrate the small wins that you get in this game. So it's definitely not game over yet, but they, they can be happy with that one. Perhaps a little bit of fatigue setting into some of the players now. They've they've had a tough week. Some of these passes they wouldn't they wouldn't be making if they were if they were fresh. Less than four minutes remaining and two points the difference. Make it Aoki to Wheeler. How many times have we said that? Newbie gliding backwards. Yeah. Another cha another change up for Japan as well. They brought Yukinobi Ike back on. You see Hashimoto made the impact that he did and now they're hoping, perhaps looking to close the game out. So instinctive between these two. Yeah, they've been uh, Japan's number one lineup for a number of years, and uh, obviously Hashimoto is pushing his way into that. But absolutely brilliant from these guys so far. This is the gold medal match. Remember, of the 2024 Quad Nations, and at the moment, that gold is traveling back to Japan unless, unless USA can overturn this deficit in the closing minutes. Chuck Aoki will just keep going every last second. The Kazaki is a wise old head and he seems revived after his interchange with Hashimoto. 
And once again, Japan not in any hurry to score their tries. No, just eating up a little bit of the clock. They know they've got the goal, goals advantage, so uh, yeah. Playing smart rugby at the moment. Wise heads. 46 plays 44. A lot of hustle out there. Wheeler, nowhere to go. Aoki gets impeded by Kusaba. Aoki is stuck in there. And he's really fighting to get out. Wheeler looking for friends, can't find any. 17 on the shot clock. Aoki back in the quarterback position and running it back. 45-46, 2.21 on the clock. USA need a turnover. Oh. Which way is the ref going to give it? Oh, to Japan. Newby, Newby got a hand in there, but not quite enough that got the turnover. The replacements being run Hashimoto on Ikazaki off Kurahashi on as well and Norimatsu so three changes for Japan Ike the only man to remain key defense being employed by the USA who invite Japan and Hashimoto to strike into the final two minutes. 15 on the shot clock. Hashimoto traversing the core and the key yeah. and sneaking in on the right-hand side. Yeah, taking his time, being patient, letting the space develop. That's exactly what happened. Big, big blast from Hashimoto who rocks Aoki and may just have made sure of the gold. Yeah, that might be the icing on the cake. And, that, and that's what the beauty of being able to swap three high point players around. You're always seeing a different picture. You never know what you're supposed to be defending as, as USA. So, so as soon as they get into a rhythm, Japan have been switching it up and just, just challenging the, the norm. Talk about a super sub. Hashimoto, beasts, Chuck Aoki, and he's first to the, the bounce of his own mess and races home. 48 45, 96 seconds to go. Yeah. It is a mountainous task from here. Three try lead, yeah. They'd be, Japan will be feeling confident right now, but like we said, Fat Lady hasn't sung yet. We've got, they've got to close it out. They haven't given away any chances so far in this quarter, Japan. They've looked super assured. USA having to really graft and the hits keep raining in from the Japanese who are supercharged in these closing moments of the final. Ike receives. Gets wrapped up, Hashimoto, who just oozes confidence in every revolution of his tyres. Look at him, barge his way through, Ike stooping low. Yeah, and just showing off his function there. So hops out of a pick, and Lee Fadet is a really strong pick as a one-point player. And Hashimoto bumped it like it was nothing. Simmons does well to ride the hit from Hashimoto and Aoki just squeaks across. Two points the difference. Japan go downtown. Hashimoto's there. He's got the strength to hold it up. Kurahashi's right in the thick of things there too. Oh, that's huge. 
You never reach right at the end of the game. Well, I suppose USA had to try and force something, but it means that they'll now be down a player. I wouldn't be surprised to see Japan run out the clock right the way to the end of this now, being having a man advantage. That's, in my opinion, pretty much the game. Japan looks like they are going to be catching a flight back to Tokyo with slightly heavier luggage because they're going to have a load of gold medals in their hall. Hashimoto, he's been the man and he might just get the last word and try on this final. He brings up a half century for the Japanese. A last desperate roll of the dice from the USA, but guess who? Hashimoto picks it off in the Cardiff skies. And an enormous performance from Japan. A quality fourth quarter. And a gold medal winning evening here in the Welsh capital sees Japan claim the Quad Nations crown 2024. Yeah, you can see what it means to them as well. Massive smiles on the Japanese players' faces. Getting one over on USA, always, always massive in this sport. So, so yeah, they'll be happy with how they perform today. The disappointment writ large across the face of Chuck Aoki. An opportunity for Quad Nations gold gone. They came up against an incredibly impressive Japanese side. Yeah. And, and you've got to put hands off to USA. They didn't win any of their opening round robin pool games. Came out did a number on uh, GB this morning and, and put up an absolutely amazing fight against Japan. Um, they'll be looking to build on this going forward to, to Paris. Oh, and uh, they very, very magnanimously thank the crowds here at the Sport Wales National Centre who've been along for the ride in noisy fashion all day, all week in fact, be it GB, be it France, be it USA or the champions Japan. And a moment to savour for this group of wheelchair rugby stars. Well, it all started so brightly in that fourth must-win quarter for the USA with Aoki looking in the mood and then that error from yeah. Ike, such a rarity. And Chuck on it in a flash. And that was kind of as good as it got, really. It and, was. Uh, Japan just found another level, didn't they? Just shows the quality of these two teams. There were very few turnovers, but the ones that did happen, they did seem to go in Japan's favour. and. And they made USA pay. They, they capitalized on everyone they got. Hashimoto. Can't speak in higher volumes of him. The impact that he made every time he came onto the court, not just in his finishing, but huge number of turnovers as well. Just his general urgency and, and energy that he brought to those around him. Yeah, just in, in, the, in the three short years that I've been away from the sport, he has come on leaps and bounds. He is... He is definitely a bright, bright spark for the future. So the future bright, but also just that ability to, to interchange those high point players as a, as a triumvirate, you know, you're never off the hook with Japan now. No, and it means that they can, they can adjust their strength and conditioning programs. They can, um, they can make sure that they're, they're having that maximum impact. Well, as Jim darts off 
onto the court to go and grab a moment with some of our champions and some of the individuals who've given us so much joy across this week's competition. It just gives us a moment to reflect on what a year we have in store as far as wheelchair rugby is concerned. The Canada Cup to come. But the big one, the Paralympics in Paris. All four of our nations will have grand designs. And one of those medalled prizes, one of those fated prizes. And Japan are a serious threat. It's official. Stunning performance in this final against the world ranked number one in USA. Jim has travelled court side, and I think we might get to hear from a bronze medal winning coach in Paul Shaw. This is a bit of an interview for it. Hi, so joined here with Paul Shaw, aka Tez, GB's head coach. How have you found the tournament? Uh, absolutely brilliant. To have everybody come out this week and support us has been excellent. To have the, the teams who came to this tournament and um, Give a really good show for everybody this week has been really, really good for us all. And you've come away with a bronze medal, not what you'd have been targeting coming into this tournament. You won all your group games, looked in a really strong position. This morning's game against USA, how did that go? Well, we were a little bit flat and we did discuss that afterwards, but I was really pleased with the way we came back in the second game against France. So um, we're, we're not pleased with the result overall, but we're happy with the, uh, the game this afternoon especially. Yeah, and you mentioned that against France. So they are back-to-back -back European champions, which I'm sure hurts you as, it mu as much as it does me to say. But getting one over them in Cardiff, how did that come about this afternoon? Well, this is all about preparation for, for Paris. And, you know, where you can get your win, that'd be great. You know, we, we played well. Um, France are a formidable team. And to be able to get a result against them was great. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned Paris later this year. What are GB doing next? What's the next building block that you're looking to achieve? So we are going to Canada in June, which will be another preparation tournament. And then we have the final run into uh, to Paris, which will be uh, great. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye. So bronze for GB and Paul Shaw and all of this just adding to that experiential well to dip deep into when it comes to the Paralympics in Paris. What a week. What an incredible day and week's action. Four of the best have delivered three of the best days wheelchair rugby at the Quad Nations. where it was all done that's where it was all fought over that rubber skidded hardwood floor that is going to look very very similar but across La Manche in Paris come the summer this one of the forerunners before the biggest competition on the planet and those coaches Jim are going to be feeling rather optimistic about their chances after their performances here this weekend this oh, I keep on saying weekend we're in the middle of the week middle how, of the week how, how good we basically had an early weekend halfway through the week that's exactly what it feels like no I think the Japanese coaches are going to be really chuffed with with how their team have performed this week 
lay down a marker. That's exactly what you want to do. There's only one more tournament before the Paralympic Games, and and you really want to be uh, putting putting the fear amongst the opposition. And I think that's what Japan have done done this week. I think as well when you consider the stage that it's been done upon, the European Championships were held next door in the Principality Stadium last year, and the whole point or you know one of the tenets of the Quad Nations is to replicate that Paralympic experience in terms of the team entries, the broadcast, the fan experience and also the court thereon, including the timings of field of play entry, which, which sounds marginal, but at the very elite end of yeah. performance, well, you'll, you'll be able to tell me because you've won a gold. You know they, they all count towards the big picture. They, they do, and and having that that knowledge, that experience, what it's going to be like, even if it's not the real thing, you get a, you get a flavour for it, and that's exactly what Cardiff have done, and 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 the event here. So that it, it's it's amazing what Cardiff do for for the sport of wheelchair rugby, and and we always love coming here, and so do the team. So brilliant to see they've they've invited us back again. We just saw a shot of Joe Delagrave, the USA coach. We've spoken about the, the Japanese coaches uh, laying down a marker and building upon it. Well, what's, what's going to be going through Joe's mind now after seeing his, his world-ranked number one side not go all the way and, and also have a bit of a sticky week in all truth? Yeah. No, he'll be disappointed, no doubt. I mean, they, they have high standards and, and they like to, to match up to them. And, and obviously, Joe's going to be disappointed. They'll take some work on, they'll take some reviews. They've had a sticky week, not all of their fault. I think they've had a little bit of illness within the camp, but, but they, they'll be the first to admit, no, no excuses, they weren't quite good enough today. Well, it's a quick turnaround for when it comes to receiving medals. But what were your memories of, you know, of the the heat of the aftermath just after you've won something or, or claimed a medal you know is it, is it a bit of a blur can you sort of sort of pinpoint those emotions and this whole part about the the pomp and ceremony for the medals to be honest after after the the gold medal in in tokyo it was i remember the cat I've, I've watched the game back the camera pans to me and i'm i'm just in utter relief and then they quickly pan to someone who's actually celebrating because i'm head in hand saying oh thank goodness that is done Perhaps not in quite so uh, civil language, but yeah, that, that was my first thoughts. Well, it's time for a few medals, coordination style, to be dished out now as Team USA lead us on our way, followed by side that vanquished them in that brilliant final all in red the Japanese team generously applauded by their coaching team and well it's not just the coaches it's a whole staff it's a whole body of people and that's not even beginning to mention the friends and families that support all of these athletes to go on their individual journeys which contribute to a team triumph. And, it, and you've touched on it there, it really is a team, team sport and, and the backup, everything that's involved. Wheelchair Rugby and Mary Daunt, Senior Independent Director, Great Britain Wheelchair Rugby. The winner of the bronze medal, Great Britain. So led by the flag bearers out, it is time to award Great Britain, represented by Gavin the Walker, the VIPs for Coggan, our medal ceremony, Robinson, Jason Brisbane, Jack Smith, the CEO David of Ross, Great Britain Wheelchair Nick Rugby, Cummins, and their Mary Dawn, Ollie Senior Mannion, Independent Director Kieran of Great Flynn, Britain Wheelchair Rugby, Jamie and I know that Aaron this Phipps, is an event they're Bay so West. proud and to host the nations of the world and Coach of they'll Great be Britain. immensely proud Paul to Shaw. be hanging a medal assisted by around Adam that GB team's Yeah, and while GB won't be happy with a bronze medal, they know it's a stepping stone, they know the ultimate prize is Paris and, 
and this will hopefully give them that little bit more incentive to perhaps work that little bit harder, work out the kinks, and um, hopefully it'll be their day. The winner of the silver medals, United States of America. The USA were represented by Chuck Aoki, Eric Newby, Travis Baker, Chuck Melton, Jeff Butler, Sarah Adam, Josh Wheeler, Lee Fredette, Josh O'Neill, Clayton Brackett, Brad Hudspeeth, Mason Simmons, coached by Joe Delagrave and assisted by Mike Klanowski. Gold medalists and the Wheelchair Rugby Quad Nations Cardiff 2024 champions, Japan. Japan, represented by Ike Yukinobu, Asagawa Yuki, Kurahashi Kai, Ando Natsuki, Ikazaki Daisuki, Kabatani Tomashigi, Kusaba Ruji, Nakamashi Shunya, Norimatsu Seiya, Ogawa Hitoshi, Hashimoto Katsuya and Shirakawa Fuya, coached by Kishi Kotaro and assisted by Yoshimori Takehide. The national anthem of Japan. Wheelchair Rugby Quad Nations Cardiff 2024 Champions, Japan! Please show your appreciation one more time for our medalists.
Jim, um, memories to savour and and moments to take forward into into the biggest year of them all. It's a Paralympic year. We've we've spoken about this as a, as a lily pad, a stepping stone. Call it what you will, but this team sharing this moment, getting on that long, long flight back to Japan. They've they've travelled the farthest, but they'll leave the richest in terms of experience and also with gold medals around their neck. Yeah, you get, just looking at the pictures now, you can see how much it means. The teams here really are some of the best in the world. So they'll know how important this was. Such a big year for Paralympics. Obviously, we've got Paris coming up. All of these teams will be looking to make, make a claim at a gold medal there. GB will be disappointed coming away with a bronze, but but we're looking to retain that gold medal that they won in Tokyo. So, so yeah, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting year, and it's been a brilliant tournament. USA, France, we can't forget, have been a phenomenal team as well. So, so yeah, it's been a lovely tournament for me. Yourself, loved every second of it. Bring on the rest of the year, and bring on the big gongs. Uh, four nations, four of the best, and three of the best days of international wheelchair rugby we could wish for and some pretty all right company as well jim it's been a pleasure to have you along for the ride as well thank you for letting me join you you've been uh, showing me the ropes and uh, i've enjoyed every minute thank you well hopefully we get to share the mic again but for now from cardiff from our medalists from our champions japan and from all four nations of this fabulous competition we bid you farewell from the Wheelchair Rugby Quad Nations 2024. We look forward to seeing you on the court for more Wheelchair Rugby action soon.